Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Western North Carolina Forest Health Webinar. Um, I hope all of you are doing well with the winter weather that came in overnight. Um, hopefully, if you're on, that means you have power, so that seems awesome. I hope y'all stay warm the rest of the day. We have some excellent speakers lined up for you today. Um, you can see the agenda right there. Um, so I hope you really enjoy and get a lot out of the forest health topics that we'll be covering today. A few housekeeping to attend to before we get started. If you registered and requested CFEs for today's webinar, everyone who registered asking for that, um, we'll, we will take attendance throughout the webinar and we will send a list of participants um, to SAF and to the North Carolina Board of Registration for Foresters. Also certificates of participation will be emailed to you within a week. Um, so be prepared that it could take a couple of days for us to get that to you as we go through and vet attendance and make sure we have the right numbers associated with everyone. Now it's pretty important, you know, in this time of COVID when a lot of things are virtual, the way that they're doing credits has changed a little bit. Um, to receive credit today, you must remain on for the entirety of the webinar. And we also ask that you remain engaged. So there will be polling questions. There will be the opportunity to ask question and answers. Um, so we ask that you participate. And as a reminder, this is for three hours of category one CFEs. Now, if you requested North Carolina pesticide credits, um, we have three hours of category D, G, N, X and one category or one hour of category I. Um, for these credits, attendance will be taken at the beginning and at the end of the course. Um, you must participate in the entire webinar to get credit once again. Um, another thing that they ask is that we verify your identity at the beginning of the webinar. So please, if you um, have access to the chat box, if you could pull that open and go ahead and type your pesticide license number into the chat box right now. Um, this is our best way of verifying identity without access to your videos. Um, another requirement for pesticide credits is you must remain engaged throughout the entirety of the webinar. So um, please respond to all of the poll questions that are asked. Each speaker um, has one to three questions that will pop up and you'll be able to respond to those. Um, you can also use your raise hand function if that's prompted by the speaker, or you can type answers into the chat box. Um, we also encourage you to engage um, using the Q&A box. Um, that is the best way for you to ask questions. And you can type it at any point while the speaker is speaking. And then at the end of each presentation, I will go through that um, question and answer box and make sure that each one of those questions is addressed. If you do need a participation certificate, but you did not need a um, registration for foresters or a certified forester credit, then send me an email and I can put you on a list and make sure that you get a certificate of participation as well. I know last time we had some folks who were doing it for extra credit for an NC State class. We had some Forest Service folks that um, needed to indicate that they were participating as well. So shoot me an email. My email is right there, kelly underscore oten at ncsu.edu. And last but not least, thank you again for joining us today. Um, it means a lot that we're able to reach so many people. Um, as a heads up, captions are available for this event. Um, the event is being live captioned. So you can pull that up um, if you would like by clicking show subtitle. Um, and at the end of the webinar, we will have an exit survey. It should automatically pop up when the webinar closes, but I will also pop it in the chat box at the end of the webinar so that you can access it that way as well. Um, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Allison Ballantyne with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. She is the Gypsy Moth Coordinator. Um, so I will turn it over to Allison to talk about Gypsy Moth and give you all an update for today. Good morning. Thank you all. Just give me a second here. I'll grab my screen and we'll get started. Did 
don't know why it doesn't want to let me find my presentation this morning. Give me one second. I apologize about this. Here we go. Okay. Okay, can everyone see this? Are we good? Thanks again for having me. Sorry about that technical difficulty for a minute. Um, again, my name is Allison Valentine. I am the Gypsy Moth Program Manager here with North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Um, I'll just give you a brief update on our Gypsy Moth program, our plans for 2021, and kind of just go over the program and <clears throat> the history of Gypsy Moth. So we'll start this morning with just a quick poll. If you all could just choose uh, which picture you believe the Gypsy Moth larvae to be, so A, B, or C. As an FYI, you should be able to move the polling box around to look at the, the pictures. Okay, great. So our polling shows that 60% of you chose C, which is the correct option. Um, so a large portion of the calls we get to report Gypsy Moth turn out to be one of the two common lookalikes, which I've shown in A is the uh, fall webworm, and then B is the eastern tent caterpillar. The two distinguishing features I like to differentiate between these three pests is the, first of all, the Gypsy Moth larvae, the coloring. Uh, on the back of its, um, on the back, it has five pairs of blue dots followed by six pairs of red. And then also the fact that the gypsy moth doesn't form a tent. So it does produce silk. Uh, the small larvae will spin a short silken thread, which allows them to be blown by the wind and relocate, but um, they do not produce tents like the fall webworm and the eastern tent caterpillar. So. There we are. So what is the gypsy moth? It's a destructive exotic forest pest that was accidentally introduced back in the late 1860s, 1869 to be exact. Um, it was accidentally, inter accidentally introduced by an amateur entomologist, uh, Mr. Etienne Leopold Truvelo. Um, his misguided intentions were to crossbreed the larvae or caterpillars with native caterpillars for silk production. So the story goes, during a storm, his research station, which was located in Medford, Massachusetts, which is just outside of Boston, uh, was blown over and a few of the caterpillars escaped. Since the introduction, Gypsy Moth has moved north, south, and west, and is currently established through the northeast, into the Midwest, and into the southern parts of the United States, as well as Canada. Um, although Truvelo did not successfully create the silk industry with his idea, he did indeed create a multi-million dollar industry for gypsy moth control. So we have him to thank for that. Uh, the life cycle of the gypsy moth, it overwinters as an egg mass, as you can see in the center of the screen. Uh, the egg mass is tan or buff colored and hairy. It's typically oval in shape and it's about the size of a quarter. Each one can contain anywhere from 300 to 1,000 eggs. So the females will lay their egg mass. They prefer sheltered areas such as the underside of a tree limb or a bark furrow, but they really can lay them anywhere on any smooth surface, lawn ornaments, play equipment, car wheels. And that's kind of one of our, um, we attribute that to movement as well. Uh, the caterpillar kind of emerges shortly after the oak foliage starts to uh, expand. Um, this is the destructive stage of the pest. It's the only stage that actually eats anything. Uh, but each caterpillar will go through different instars depending on whether it's male or female. Um, five for male, six for female. And then each instar lasts about two weeks. Then they pupate. 
down in the bottom right hand corner, the pupa, the larger one is the female and the smaller one is the male. And when they emerge into adults, the male emerges first. Once the female emerges, she immediately starts um, sending off a pheromone. In the lower left hand corner, you'll see the lighter colored moth is the female, the larger one is the female, while the smaller, darker colored moth is the male. Uh, the female's flightless, so she just sends off her pheromone and it's up to the male to locate her to me. Why is it a problem? Uh, the caterpillar stage or the larvae feed on over 300 species, but it prefers oaks. So 75 million acres have been defoliated since 1970. We have record that two and a quarter million acres were defoliated in 2017 alone. Um, the quarantine area is where the defoliation happens. We don't have a ton in North Carolina. We only have two counties quarantined at this time, but we're on the leading edge of the actual population. So 70% of the hardwood U.S. forests in the country are still at risk, but not infested. Here are a couple of pictures of heavy infested areas. So high density populations can cause extensive tree mortality, adversely affect commerce, uh, can cause allergic reactions for sensitive individuals that touch the caterpillars, they can get a rash or they can have respiratory issues with the hairs from the caterpillars circulating in the air. Um, slippery sidewalks and debts from frass, reduced property values and high cost tree removal for homeowners. So no homeowner wants to know that there's a gypsy moth infestation in their area. So another poll, if you have a minute, uh, how much can one larvae eat? Is it one square foot of leaves per day, one square foot of leaves per week, or one square foot of leaves per month? This is by the time it's mature. Perfect, so all of you answered. We have 69% of you answered the correct answer, one square foot of leaves per day. So each egg mass containing anywhere from 300 to 1,000 eggs, a high density population, these things can really get out of control with how much they can eat. So what are we doing in North Carolina? Um, we have a trapping and treatment program as well as a regulatory program. So I'll talk about the trapping and treatment here in a minute. Our regulatory program consists of compliance agreements for industries carrying anything out of the um, quarantine area. So like I mentioned before, North Carolina only has two counties that are currently under quarantine. It's Dare and Currituck, and that hasn't changed since the late 80s. So we've done a good job of containing this with the Slow the Spread program, which I'll go into here in, in. Slow the Spread program was a pilot program back in the 90s. And it was so successful that Congress started funding it in 2000. So North Carolina, along with 10 other states along the leading line here of the gypsy moth population um, are involved with this federal program. So here on this map that I borrowed from Minnesota, a colleague in Minnesota, um, the dark area is our gypsy moth quarantine. And then the lighter blue area is our action area. So everything in the action area is funded by the Slow the Spread program, all the trapping and the treatment that occur in that area. So you can see North Carolina, that's, it's about the, the top half to third of our state is where we have the Slow the Spread program. So just to give you an idea of how successful this has been, since it was funded in 2000, the natural movement of a gypsy moth population is about 13 miles a year. And this program has knocked that back to about three. So over 70% of movement has been knocked back by this program. Um, here's a, just a quick observation. So you can see what the projections look like, what the natural gypsy moth spread would look like with and without the slowest spread program. So we're very grateful for the fact that it's extremely successful. So here's, um, we trapped the entire state at different, at different um, densities. So just to give you an idea of what you're looking at here on this map, this is a map of our moth catches from 2020. So the green area is our slow the spread program. And then the white area is our 
program, our area that's funded by APHIS. So we trap the entire state. In the green area, we trap at two kilometer density, while we trap at three kilometer in the white area. So it's typical to get a lot of these catches. You'll see a lot towards the northern border where, where Virginia, and that's a really high density population populated area for the gypsy moth. So it's typical to see those numbers up there. Um, down in the white area, we've had a couple of pop-ups in the western part of the state. Last year, we treated the Mount Mitchell area, and this year we're going to treat, you can see those two red dots on the east and west side of that treatment block that we performed last year. Um, there's some rentals in the area. We think maybe that's how it was introduced there. But another one of our treatments in this red area up towards the north in Surrey County, that's a typical treatment area for us. And then the Dare County out on the coast, that red area, that was um, introduced a few years back. We've been trying to treat that, I think since 2016, and that was a homeowner introduction. I believe someone from New York brought that down. But if you see anything, uh, these typical green and white or green and yellow dots in the white area, um, anything that's a one to three catch is typically kind of dissipates on its own. 90% of the time, it just kind of goes away, it, depending on where it's located. So those green and yellow dots closer to the Virginia border are more, um, we're, we're looking at those a little bit heavier than anything down in this white area. Those typically go away on their own. So with the Slow the Spread program, we get together every year, we look at this data, and then we decide where to go ahead and put our resources for treatment. Um, the website here, the gypsymothsts.org is the Slow the Spread program website. And we have this information available since 2007, all of our catch treatment data, delimits, everything you could want to know about the Gypsy Moth program and what we've done since 2007. So if you're interested in looking at that historical data, that website under the decision algorithm is where you'll wanna look. So what kind of treatments do we use in North Carolina? Typically we'll do a mating disruption treatment because in our area, we have a lot of low density populations. Anything under a 20 or 30 catch is usually a good, um, good to be using a gypsy or a mating disruption on. So basically the product is, a, is specific to gypsy moth. We're using splat organic right now. Um, it's aerially applied, low flying aircrafts, it saturates the area with the pheromones so the male can't find the female to mate and that's what it does. Um, it's pr the public is pretty welcoming to this. It's made, it's an organic product and then the carrier is a food grade organic wax based product. So the public's been pretty receptive to this, this product. Uh, the other thing that we use in a higher density population will be the larvicide. Um, we're currently using BTK or the 4A48B, which is also an organic product, but it gets a little bit trickier because of other lepidopteran species that could be targeted with this, with this, um, this type of application. But this year, both treatments are applied aerial. The mating disruption, we use a fixed wing while the larvicide would use a helicopter. So just to give you an idea of our treatments for this year, the Buxton treatment, which is in Dare County on the coast, um, you can see the numbers in the shaded area, and I apologize that these are in black and white. Uh, the numbers in the area, shaded area are our catch numbers. And then the shaded area itself is the treatment block. The dotted line on the outside is what we call our buffer zone. So we have a two kilometer area outside of the block where we notify homeowners and let them know that we're gonna be making these applications and ask for public comment. So this is the only product or this is the only treatment we plan on doing BTK this year. Um, this is 450 acres and we just kind of wanna knock this one out. The treatments in the western part of the state, Mount Mitchell, this is overlaps Yancey and Buncombe counties. It's 1,760 acres, and we caught three male moths there in 2019, that up to seven male moths, which is a small number for our treatment, but since it's so close to the corresponding big block in Mount Mitchell we did last year, we kind of want to just go ahead and eradicate this. 
And Celo's just on the other side of the Mount Mitchell block we treated last year. Um, it's in Yancey County. In 2019, we had eight male moths that up to 28 this year. So we'll be doing splat as well. Marianne West is in McDowell County. It's about 1,330 acres. We had five moths in 2019 that upped to 34. So that's another splat treatment. And then Lambsburg is a typical area where we do splat treatments up in Surrey County. It's just over 2,000 acres. One male moth up to 25 in 2020. So we'll be doing another splat treatment there. And then this is just a list of all the treatments. Total, we're looking at 450 acres for BTK and 7,655 for mating disruption. Um, last year we did zero BTK acres and just over 18,000 for mating disruption. So we've knocked it down a little bit this year, but that's all I've got. Uh, if you have any questions, everything's online this year. We weren't able to do in-person public meetings. So this website that I have here, uh, you can go listen to an informational video. You can actually ask for notifications for treatment. So we'll let you know via text or email the day before we plan on putting the planes in the air. Uh, the mating disruption treatments usually happen in mid to late June, and then the BTK is in April. Any questions? If you have a question, go ahead and type it in the Q&A box. There were a few that came in that I was able to answer um, while you were speaking, Allison. So Thanks, Kelly. Good. <laughs> go ahead and type those in if you have any. Um, Allison, will you stay on through Whitney's presentation? I will, yes. OK, so go ahead and type those. We're going to go ahead and switch to Whitney's presentation now. Um, Allison will stay on, so if you have any gypsy moth questions for her, she will be able to answer them after Whitney's talk. So Whitney, I will turn it over to you to talk about the spotted lanternfly, um, a incoming pest that Whitney will share. Thank you, Kelly. So hopefully everyone can hear me and see my slides. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk today about the spotted lanternfly, and as Kelly said, it thankfully is a pest that we do not yet have here in North Carolina, but unfortunately I think it is just a matter of time. So before I get into this, I wanted to ask who here has heard of spotted lanternfly before? And a poll question should pop up for you to answer this. Oh, that is great to see. I'm, I'm thrilled that the vast, vast, vast majority of you have heard of this pest before. And for the 7% of you that have not heard of it, hopefully uh, after my talk today, you'll be much more familiar with what to look for uh, in our state. So uh, I always like to lead with this quote. Julie Urban is an entomologist at Penn State University. And I attended a meeting a few years back and she said, Spotted lanternfly is a freak among plant hoppers. And that has really stuck with me because this is a pest. It is, um, it is a plant hopper, member of the family Fulgority. And it's the only, one of the only known, if not the only known pest in this insect family. And as researchers continue to learn more and more and more about this insect, uh, things just get weirder. Uh, they think they've understood something and then Eselect goes and does something different. And so there's just a lot going on here. And I could really truly speak about this pest all day if I was given the chance. Um, so like many of our invasive species, spotted lanternfly is native to uh, parts of Asia, including China, Vietnam, and Bangladesh. In 2004, it was introduced into Korea where it became a major pest of grapes and peaches. It's also been introduced in Japan. And then sadly here in the United States, it was first detected in Pennsylvania in 2014. And since then, it has spread into Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, Ohio, throughout Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Virginia, and West Virginia. So you can see that it's, it's getting around. Um, it is univoltine, which means it only has one generation per year, which is potentially good news, but it's a pretty prolific producer. And one of the key concerns of this pest is it has a very broad host range, which I will go into in much greater detail in a few minutes. So I'm gonna start with the life cycle. And worth noting, the date ranges that you see on this figure are based on Pennsylvania. So here in North Carolina, if and when this pest establishes here, we expect it to operate roughly 30 to 60 days ahead of Pennsylvania's ranges. 
Um, degree day models last year predicted immersions could occur as early as March 1st here in North Carolina. Uh, so they overwinter in the egg stage. And actually kind of similarly to gypsy moth, the egg masses are quite small. They're about a quarter in size. Uh, they look, I kind of describe it as like smeared mud or silly putty on a tree, but as you can see in this zoomed in image, they're highly camouflaged. They are really, really hard to see uh, on the objects they're laid upon. And one of the biggest concerns with the egg masses is that spotted lanternfly, like gypsy moth, will lay their eggs on just about anything. They really, really enjoy laying their eggs on rusted metal, so you can imagine train cars would be a really big cause for concern here, and they are. Um, you know, yard, lawn equipment, camping gear, vehicles, what have you, they will lay their eggs on it. And so uh, this causes a lot of hitchhiking to occur, whether intentionally or not, and something that we really encourage people to be on a lookout for, especially if you have traveled into one of these quarantine areas, and I'll show a map later, and then are coming back into a non-quarantine or not infested state. The hatched eggs look like this on a tree. And again, they're quite small. You can see where the little, you know, instars have emerged. And I like to show this picture, this female here, if you can see my mouse moving, has just laid this egg mass directly on top of a gypsy moth egg mass. You can see they're just about the same size. The main difference of the gypsy moth egg masses, as Allison said, are uh, tend to be kind of tan orangish and they're hairy. The spotted lanternfly egg masses are not hairy at all. They're, they're almost more smooth than anything. Uh, they will around late spring uh, start emerging into their nymphal stages, and they have four. Uh, the first three are pretty nondescript. They're very small. They're black with white polka dots. In fact, that burst in star is so small, it's about the size of a tick. And really, the only way you could tell it apart from a tick is if you were to try and go and grab it, it would hop away because it's a plant hopper. The fourth in star is the one that I would expect people to really begin noticing in the field. So they're about half an inch in size and they're this gorgeous bright red color. They have the black and white uh, patterns and then you can see the wing buds have begun to develop on these fourth end stars. Here in North Carolina, I would expect we would likely see these maybe, maybe early June. Um, I would say June for sure. It just went in June yet it remains to be seen. Uh, and then the adults, this is the truly charismatic life stage uh, and the one that if it's here, you're gonna know. So they're actually quite large. They're about an inch from nose tip to wing tip. And in most cases, if you were to see them in, in the wild, you'd see them in this appearance with their wings held behind their back. They very rarely, they're poor flyers. They, if anything, more glide than fly. You might see them with their wings spread in this really gorgeous pattern, but less common. So I really want people to kind of keep this top image as your mental image when searching in the field. Um, and all of the life stages, the egg masses, the instars, and the adults are incredibly good hitchhikers. Um, I've read reports of the nymphal stages clinging onto vehicles going over 60 miles per hour down a, a heavy highway. Um, the adults, they are being found on just about anything. Um, it's, it's pretty wild. So I mentioned they're good hitchhikers, but why do we actually care? What's, what's the real big problem with this pest? Well, there's a lot of different things. So economic impacts is always an easy one to talk about. Uh, a few years back, uh, the federal government put in a $17.5 million uh, emergency fund for this pest. And of course, a bunch of different states, those impacted already and those like North Carolina who are, were just in the preparation mode are spending a lot of time, money, and you know, manpower on either combating this pest or prepping for this pest. Of course, farmers, uh, if stakeholders are also impacted. Um, one really alarming statistic I like to share with people is that um, wine producers or grape producers in Pennsylvania, some vineyards have seen a 271% increase in pesticide costs um, within just two years, just combating this pest. You can see in this top image, all these adults on a grapevine. This bottom image is all adults on an apple tree. Environmental, environmental impacts, maybe still too early to know for sure, but I think we're long-term gonna see a lot of things. They cause understory uh, damage. I'm gonna show some images of the kind of city mold buildup you might see with this pest. Um, they do, of course, kill grapevines. I'll just show a pretty drastic picture here of complete vineyards that have been wiped out because of the spotted lantern fly. I will stress this is not you know, a one-time, one-year thing. It does take a couple years for this to happen, but if you don't have the time and resources and money, of course, to combat these things, they will kill plants over time. One piece of good news is so far, they've only been shown to kill grapevines and Tree of Heaven, which is a host I'll get to in a minute. 
Um, but I, my fear is that if this continues, you know, year after year after year, trees that or plants that are being infested and trying to fight back, eventually they're just not going to have the strength to fight back anymore. Human impacts is a big one I want to touch on. So in addition to causing problems for plant life, these insects produce copious, copious, copious amounts of honeydew. And I cannot stress that enough. And if you're not sure what honeydew is, it essentially means they poop sugar water. So you can be outside enjoying your deck on a beautiful sunny day, but if you have an infestation in your backyard, you will think that it is raining and it is raining sugar water down on you. Mold is growing on people's homes. They get in people's backyards. They're going into businesses. I've seen them go into Target. Um, you cannot escape this pest if you live in an area with an infestation. And I could tell some really hilarious stories, but I know I have limited time, so I'll, I'll keep it to that today. In addition, they attract stinging insects. All that nice, you know, sugar water in the air brings in your stinging insects, you know, ants, hornets, you have it. Um, other things that they do, if you imagine all of this sugar water kind of pouring down out of the trees, that's gonna ferment over time. And the smell is awful. I have to admit, I have not personally experienced it yet, but Allison has. A few of other, other coworkers have gone up to Pennsylvania when the adults are active. And they came back with just stories of how bad the smell was. You just can't escape it. Uh, commodities affected, of course, is the really big thing. So important things, apples, peaches, cherries, grapevines I've already mentioned, hops are affected, maples, walnuts, poplar, birch, all trees that are affected. There are over 70 plant species that have been identified as hosts of spotted lanternfly so far, and that number does keep growing. Things like poison ivy, china berry are on the list. Um, of course, wild grape is on the list, and so you can just see how easy this is. But the key one I've kind of briefly mentioned is tree of heaven. Weirdly, that is this pest's favorite, favorite, favorite food. It will actually choose tree of heaven over any of these other plants I've mentioned, which you think, oh, well, that's great news. Tree of heaven's an invasive, so if they're feeding on that, wonderful. But the problem is tree of heaven, as many of our invasives, it's everywhere. I'm sure you've all seen it before or seen it and not realized you've seen it. I don't think I have a picture. Oh, I do have a picture. So tree of heaven. This is something you commonly see, say, driving around the highway. Western North Carolina is covered in tree of heaven. We've been surveying just for tree of heaven for the past few years. And my kind of bad joke is always that we should spend our time surveying where it's not found because that'd be easier for all of us. Um, so the reason this is such a big concern is if this invasive insect has its food readily available, how do you really get rid of it? And that's, that's one of the key problems. And there are some things that other states are doing to try and combat this. Um, so in terms of the damage itself, I've talked about the city mold a little bit, but you can see here, uh, this is understory that is just covered in city mold because of that honeydew being produced from trees. And I have a zoomed out picture, which I didn't include here, but some of the tree of heaven around this area have just hundreds, if not thousands of adults on them. Fungal mats will begin to develop at bases of trees. So you get this kind of white fungus and then this weird black, that's of course all from honeydew just dropping down from the trees. And this, you know, the zoomed out images, every one of these trees in this little forested area have this on them or bested. And then I always, always include this photo. So this is uh, a gentleman or person who had made the mistake of parking his truck. He worked in a maintenance facility up in Pennsylvania or works. And he uh, parked his truck just under a tree of heaven tree line, not thinking about it. And so this is all, this is his vinyl truck bed cover. And you can just see, I mean, just how much honeydew on this one truck. And so if kind of you think big picture, how just gross and bad this can be big, you know, long-term. And then here's a, if you haven't gotten the idea yet for me stressing the honeydew, here's a nice video that captures that honeydew dropping down. So you can see in the middle here. And again, if you picture, thousands of these insects doing this at the same time, it really can get out of control and you know, all these adults on this one tree. And then uh, to kind of finally drive home the idea of how out of control. So uh, here is those egg masses. And then um, I, I did forget to mention each egg mass contains roughly 35 to 50 eggs. So better than gypsy moth, which can have up to a thousand eggs, but still that's a lot of eggs, a lot of egg masses on one tree. And you can imagine how quickly out of control this can get. These are those bright, vibrant fourth end stars on Tree of Heaven. And then this picture on the right, I mean, my goodness, this is someone's backyard and these are all adults. And I cannot imagine walking out into my backyard and seeing this one day. Um, it, it's really, it's a sight to see. It's, it's, it's pretty wild. I've never seen anything like it, I will admit, for being an entomologist. Um, 
I do want to mention there are a couple of different trap or trap concepts that are being looked at and considered. Most of you, I imagine, are familiar with the tree band. Um, it's essentially just a piece of paper with tangle foot that goes you know, around a tree. These have been pretty good. And you can see here all of these early instars that have been captured. But one of the downsides to tree bands is a lot of beneficial insects end up getting captured, along with other animals. You know, snakes, lizards, birds get on these. And so there's so much bycatch that it really, yes, you can kind of monitor for the insect, but it ultimately might be doing more harm than good. Plus, you have to replace them on a pretty frequent basis, which can be very time consuming. They've also tested something called a bug barrier, which is essentially that tree band, but it's inverted. So the sticky stuff is on the inside and that foam is being used to kind of keep the trap off the tree. These are better at reducing the bycatch, but there's still more on these than we'd like to see. So the traps that we are going to be using and most of the other states are starting to use are called circle traps. And it's essentially a, piece of screen in a tent form stapled to a tree with a container at the top. It can be a bag, it can be something like this. Um, the downside to these is they're costly uh, to purchase, uh, they're hard to produce, and there's not actually a pheromone lure yet for spotted lanternflies, so they're using methyl salicylate, which I believe is a byproduct produced by Tree of Heaven. So it is an attractant, it does bring them in, but it's not going to control this insect, it's more for monitoring. So we will here in North Carolina be placing these in some key areas this year, uh, areas where we have found uh, single dead adults, and we're also going to be placing them um, at rest areas, um, specifically along the Virginia border and areas coming into the state, since Virginia does have, unfortunately, some problems with this pest. Um, and the main thing other states are doing, and we are prepared to do here if and when this pest does arrive, uh, is using that tree of heaven, the Ailanthus, for control and suppression. So they're identifying small tree of heaven, six inches DBH or less, and they're treating with an herbicide um, and just straight up killing them. Um, and then they're looking at larger tree of heaven, so greater than six inches DBH, and they're treating with an insecticide. In this case, uh, it's dinotefferon. It's just a bark spray they're using. And because tree of heaven is so attractive to spotted lanternfly, they will, as I said, choose tree of heaven before those other hosts. The idea is they'll go to the tree of heaven, feed on it, and then, of course, because it's been injected with or excuse me, sprayed with dinotefron, they will die. It's very effective. But again, the problem is these populations are so large and it does rely on Tree of Heaven being present, which can be a mixed bag sometimes. Um, in terms of where it is, I mentioned the states at the beginning. Um, and I said it was found in 2014 in Pennsylvania. I have not mentioned yet it was first found on stone tile products believed to have been introduced or purchased and brought into the state in 2012. So it took about two years from potential introduction, that's what they think happened, before it was actually found. Currently 26 counties in Pennsylvania are under quarantine, along with a county, a couple counties in Virginia, they are about to expand it. A few in Delaware, New Jersey, and Maryland. With this map, some key things I want to highlight. If a county is filled in in blue, that means there is a known reproducing population of this insect. So you can see Ohio has one, uh, New York has a couple, Connecticut even has one. Um, if it's a purple dot, these are considered regulatory incidents. So in most cases, especially with the four that you see here in North Carolina, we've got one, two, three, four. Those were all single dead adults that are found. The areas have been thoroughly investigated. We have no reason to believe there's an actual infestation. And in North Carolina, three of the four, we know exactly what their introduction pathway was into the state. And with a little teeny bit of time, I want to touch on the four that we have here in North Carolina to stress um, kind of our concern for the state. So A, you can see the nearest infestation is Northern Virginia, but we do have four, four you know, detections in Southern North Carolina. So the very first one was actually in 2019 in Buncombe County. And this one, a business owner had purchased some supplies from a location in Pennsylvania, happened to ship out of the Pennsylvania quarantine. And when the supplies arrived, he found a single dead adult on one of the barrels uh, that he had purchased. And thankfully, he reported it to us the same day. So we were able to go out there. Um, since we know that the supplies came directly from the Pennsylvania quarantine, we are absolutely certain that it was just a single hitchhiker. We've surveyed the area. We have no reason to believe that there's anything else going on there, which is great news. The second one was this year um, in Mecklenburg County. It was actually a kind of bizarre, an airplane mechanic found a dead adult inside the cargo hold of an airplane. So again, a little alarming. They, they're they also taking flights uh, and uh, we've consulted with people in Pennsylvania, because they've had some experience with this. And thankfully, so far, 
no SLF have been found to survive an airplane ride. So I'm hoping that as long as they don't manage to make it into the passenger uh, area of the planes, that this will remain the case. Um, but something we are definitely keeping an eye on and, and other states are trying to do their best to prevent SLF from catching rides on airplanes. Uh, our next detection is this one in Henderson County. It's actually right on the border of Buncombe, even though the dots in the center of the map. This is a weird one. This is the one that we're not entirely certain about its pathway in. So it was reported via I Naturalist. And when we talked to the person who reported it, turned out her mother had, uh, was looking at model homes. She was visiting, you know, just model home sites. And this was a prefabricated home. And she found the dead adult on the floor inside the house. So it's not a house that's lived in. It's just one of those, you know, you can drive up to it and go walk in these houses. And we've worked with the company. The company says they were built in Southern Virginia. There's no known infestations there. We are really, really confused about where this one came from. The fact that it's near the Asheville one did give us some pause and cause for concern. But again, we have thoroughly surveyed the area, seen no signs of infestation. So it's an area we're gonna keep a close eye on this year because we just aren't sure how that insect showed up and that's troubling. The last one uh, is another one semi-troubling. We know exactly what happened. This was actually found in Christmas trees in December. It was reported to us by a gentleman who purchased a tree and thankfully is from Pennsylvania and is familiar with the pest. Um, we you know, were able to take his tree after Christmas. We kept and checked it, no egg masses. But the troubling thing is upon investigation, there were 144 trees brought in from Pennsylvania um, they should not have been able to leave Pennsylvania. That's something Pennsylvania is looking to on their end. But we, of course, only know about the one tree that this gentleman reported. And so we hope that none of the other trees had egg masses or life stages on them, but we can't be sure. We did do a big outreach boost around the area to raise awareness and ask people to please look at their trees. I did not hear a single thing um, around December, January, never got a phone call. So I'm taking that as good news, but that's an area we will be heavily surveying in 2021 because if, if there were insects on one tree, they were dead, they were dead, but um, it's still, you know, you just never know. We wanna keep a close eye on that. Um, so this leads me to kind of my last point. If you think you've seen spotted lanternfly in North Carolina, please report it to badbug at ncagr.gov. Um, we have a couple people manning this email address. Uh, if you take a photo, please take a photo. Try to include a reference, a size reference if possible, like a coin or a pin. Uh, I've told people I would rather get a thousand false reports than have someone uh, see one and not report it because they don't think it's a big deal. Please, 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 if you think you might have seen it any life stage, let us know. Our goal is to not let this establish in North Carolina and do our best possible to prevent our state from becoming like the other states dealing with this insect. And with that, I will take any questions with the time I have remaining. So thank you all so much. Wow, great presentation, Whitney. Thanks for going into those. Um, incidents of finding the adult spotted lanternfly, just a testament to everyone on this call in the western part of the state to keep their eyes out and report it to that bad bug email that Whitney just posted. Um, there are a few questions. I'll go through them one by one. And then there was one directed towards um, Allison for Gypsy Moth. So I'll do that at the end of the spotted lanternfly ones. All right, the first question is, are there lookalikes and how do you distinguish between them? Great question. So there, there are some lookalikes, nothing that is that closely resembles, um, but I can see how people uh, who aren't as familiar with insects as, as, you know, an entomologist like me is would get confused. So there's actually a butterfly, and I, of course, I'm going to blank on the name right now, but there's one butterfly that looks really, really similar to this image that you see on the screen right now. Um, but it's a butterfly, so it'll fly differently. It flies. It'll never have its wings held back the way a spotted landrefly would. As I mentioned, spotted lanternfly is a large insect, so a lot of the lookalikes are actually quite small, which is why I asked for people to include a size reference. There's a couple of derbid species um, that I've had people send me photos of that have given me like a, oh no, is this spotted lanternfly? But once I'm able to figure out, oh, this is actually a very tiny insect, I quickly rule it out. Of course, a lot of your true bugs, the early instars are gonna look similar. A lot of the stink bugs have a similar shape and size. Um, and so, this is really one that the more you see it, the more you get comfortable with it. I've gotten, had an opportunity to go up to Pennsylvania and see this in action, see them live. And we have a lot of resource specimens here in North Carolina, dead specimens, of course. Um, 
But the main thing I would encourage people to look for are those polka dots, um, especially if you're looking at an early instar, the pure black with those white polka dots is a good key feature. And then I don't know of really anything that looks like the fourth instar, that bright red one. It's, it's pretty, pretty standout on its own. And then the adults, yeah, it really is butterflies that people are getting confused with the adults more than anything. Yeah, I think I've seen um, leopard moths and tiger moths. Um, yes, those two are taken. Yeah. I'll try and find the other one and I'll pass it along to you maybe, Kelly, if I can find the name of it. It's kind of funny how how similar this one particular butterfly looks. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. The polka dots and the, and the red wings. So. Oh, someone said the hawk moth butterfly. It might be that one. It very well might be that one. All right, next question. Are all spotted lanternflies female? Oh, Great question. So no, they aren't. Um, one thing that I did not include in the talk today, um, just as there wasn't time, they're definitely um, male and female. They have a really interesting behavior um, with their mating process where they will actually segregate. Females will hang out together, males will hang out together, and of course come together to mate, segregate again, and then come together again. Um, that's one of the interesting things I learned last year. I don't really know why they're doing this or what it really means for them, but they look identical. Really the only way to tell them apart that I'm familiar with in terms of just eyeballing it is that gravid females, this yellow that you see here gets much brighter and bolder and fatter if they um, are gravid and you know, have, have mated and are ready to lay eggs. But otherwise they pretty much look identical. Another question, is APHIS considering providing support to eradicate or control tree of heaven on interstates or main travel corridors? I love that question and I wish I could say yes, but as far as I know, APHIS has no plans to do anything like that, which is a shame, but yeah. Are there any known natural predators? Yes, there are. So another thing that I wish I had more time to talk about today, but um, there are a number. So weirdly, Sweater Lantern Valley is actually pretty easy to kill. Um, the native predators, prey mantises feed on them, spiders, uh, reguviates, so your assassin bugs, I'll feed on them. There's also a couple of parasitoids um, that uh, seem to be effective at killing them. Um, so that's being considered in terms of a biocontrol measure. And then there's also, you mentioned predators, but there's also intimate pathogenic funguses being looked at. And Bavaria bassiana is one of the main ones that highly effective at killing it. And that one's great because it naturally occurs in our soils here. So um, a lot of research is going into good biocontrol options. And I'm hopeful that in the coming years, we'll have some really good tools in our tool belt for combating this. Great. Um, what county was the Christmas tree occurrence? Was oh, it I'm so sorry. That one was Onslow County. So, um, you know, near the coast, but, but not quite coastal. Great. And those are all the questions I see related to spotted lanternfly. Allison, if you're still on, it looks like you are. There was one question in the chat box. Why not treat in Stokes and Rockingham counties? Sure. Mainly budget. Um, we're going to try to focus our funds on the western area to eradicate that because that's kind of further away from the actual population of gypsy moth. But we do delimit those areas. So instead of trapping at a 1K, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a 2K, we'll trap it every 500 meters and then we'll probably treat next year. Great. Thanks for the info. And thank you, both of you, um, Whitney and Allison, for joining us today and giving us a wonderful update on two very important invasive species. Um, we will now continue on the theme of invasive species and I'm going to talk about um, a couple of invasive species currently impacting North Carolina and then one in the same vein as Whitney's um, that has not yet been found here but kind of to encourage you to keep an eye out for it if possible. So um, you can see this title screen here talking about invasive species. Um, if you haven't seen this movie, it's from the movie Them. There was a lot of scare in the 1950s that big bugs were going to invade towns, um, kind of, you know, recognition of the nuclear age. Um, but really, we don't see that happening. We still are seeing invasions, though. They're just not that big. And sometimes when I do presentations about all of these invasives coming in to kill our trees, I feel like I'm always giving bad news and 
you know, people are like, oh man, just one more thing to worry about. So I'm going to try to give this presentation in the format of bad news, but also good news, ways that we can respond to these pests, how to manage it. Um, and hopefully you can see that it's not all doom and gloom. And for some of these, there are some solutions. So these are the three invasives I'm going to talk about today, the emerald ash borer, which we have in the majority of North Carolina at this point, laurel wilt, um, mainly along the coastal plains, but I'm gonna talk about why it's important to talk about this pest um, at a Western North Carolina forest health webinar. And then the Asian longhorn beetle. This is the one not yet found in North Carolina, um, but one to really keep your eye out for. So let's talk about emerald ash borer. You have probably heard about it by now. If you're in Western North Carolina, you can see the map shown here, every county where we've detected it in North Carolina, um, 61 counties, and you can see practically every county in the Western part of the state has been positive. Um, as the name suggests, they attack ash. Um, all four species of ash in North Carolina are susceptible. That's white ash, green ash, pumpkin ash, and Carolina ash, but also white fringe tree. Um, this was something determined about five to six years ago where they found emerald ash borer infesting white fringe tree in Ohio. Um, this isn't a common occurrence. We've actually only um, determined an emerald ash borer infestation in one specimen in North Carolina, but as the ash disappears, it seems likely that emerald ash borer might turn to this tree. Um, so this is a um, tree often planted as an ornamental. Sometimes the Chinese version is planted instead, and those are thought to be resistant to the emerald ash borer. Our first detection was in Granville County in 2013. And you can see it has spread quite quickly over the past um, eight years now. All right, so here's my first poll looking at the map and being this is a Western North Carolina um, webinar, I imagine many of you will answer yes, but is Emerald Ash Borer known to occur in your county? Look at that map, find yourself and hit yes or no. All right, so it looks like the majority of you as suspected do have emerald ash borer in your county. So let's um, give a brief overview of how to recognize it, how to manage it, and where do we go from here now that we know emerald ash borer um, is established. So this is what the emerald ash borer looks like. Despite it causing big problems, it's not that big. Um, this is in the palm of my hand. You can see it's you know got shiny green metallic wings. This is actually the very first specimen um, that we found in the state back in 2013. Um, despite its small size, it can cause big problems. This is an aerial photo um, I took during an aerial survey. This is actually just over the state line in Virginia. And you can see all of these whitish grayish trees in this riparian area are all green ash that were killed by the emerald ash borer. Here's another shot from Wisconsin. Um, and this is an area where ash tends to be a um, larger component of forest ecosystems, but you can see it can just come in and wipe out all the ash in a forest stand. But it's not just a problem in our forest ecosystems. Um, years ago when Dutch elm disease came through and a lot of elm trees were replanted with ash, um, now as a result we have a lot of ash street trees and now it's happening all over again. So emerald ash borer is coming through, killing a lot of these um, ash street trees, and we're kind of seeing a repeat problem when Dutch elm disease came through. So if anything, there's a lesson out of this that um, hopefully people choose to diversify, to diversify plantings when they replant. Here's an image showing um, where emerald ash borer has been detected to date on the national level. Each one of those red um, dots is a county that is positive for emerald ash borer. You can see it's popped up in Colorado, um, but it has spread quite quickly since its initial detection in Michigan in 2002. So how do you identify it? Here's a great photo of the beetle itself. It's about half an inch long, metallic green like the name emerald suggests, but it has this metallic bronze head on it as well. Now, if you see an insect that matches this, this description, I encourage you, if you can capture it, 
to pry up the wing covers and look at the body. Um, the body should be a reddish purplish color under the wing covers and that's how you know it's emerald ash borer. The larvae are found under the bark of ash trees. They can get up to about an inch and a half um, long. They are cream colored, but the diagnostic character for the larvae are these bell-shaped segments. So if you look at each segment of the larva, you can see that it starts out slightly narrow, but then flares out towards the end of the segment. So that's what we mean by bell-shaped. Signs and symptoms on the tree themselves. So we initially see canopy thinning. That's one of the first things we observe, but you might also see epicormic sprouting from the main stem of the tree. This is quite excessive. Often it's just um, one or two sprouts, um, maybe up to 20. You might also see increased woodpecker activity. Woodpeckers love to eat emerald ash borer larvae for a meal. So they will uh, fleck the bark off to try to get at those larvae. And they're often successful. In areas where emerald ash borer have been established for some time, um, they've determined that woodpecker populations have significantly increased as well. So a good natural enemy of the emerald ash borer, but unfortunately not enough to keep the populations down or at bay. One of the other things that you might see are vertical splits in the bark. So this is a split in the ash bark. You can actually see the larval galleries underneath this split right here. Oftentimes when I encounter a tree like this, this is kind of the area that I put my machete in to pry up the bark and get a better look at what's going on underneath. D-shaped exit holes. This is one of the telltale signs of emerald ash borer. So you can see it has one straight edge and then a curved edge, just like a capital D would. Um, it could be in any orientation. And this one, the straight edge is up, but it does not necessarily have to be. If you see a declining ash tree and it has a D-shaped exit hole in it, um, that's a very good sign that emerald ash borer is there. We do have other beetles um, that attack other trees that could make D-shaped exit holes, but they're about twice this size um, and they won't be in an ash tree. And then of course, those galleries that I was just talking about, as the larvae feed under the bark, they create these serpentine galleries. So they kind of go back and forth. Um, they're filled with frass, which is a fancy word for bug poop. So if you peel up the bark of a tree that you are that you suspect is infested, you should see these galleries beneath. Um, there are a few incidents in North Carolina where we use D-shaped exit holes and the galleries um, to confirm the, um, positive, um, the positive infestation of emerald ash borer and did have not actually found a specimen yet. Now that seemed like pretty bad news, especially if you're in a county that um, has emerald ash borer, but the good news is you can manage for emerald ash borer. It's not necessarily easy and it may not always be worth it, um, but there are options. There are insecticides available to treat high value ash trees. This can help a tree recover if it has already become infested with emerald ash borer. But the general rule of thumb, if a third of the canopy has already been lost, um, that's kind of the threshold. If two thirds of the canopy is still remaining, then you can probably help the tree recover. We highly recommend the stem injection of emamectin benzoate for this because it's the most effective and will give that tree the best protection for recovering. Unfortunately, once the tree gets beyond that two thirds of a healthy canopy, um, a lot of those larval galleries have girdled those transportation tissues of the tree and the tree needs those tissues in order to take up the pesticide and distribute it throughout the canopy. You can also treat a tree to protect it. Um, if you see emerald ash borer getting closer and closer to you if you're monitoring the range map, um, honestly at this point if you're in North Carolina and you have an ash tree, I think you're in the range and I would, um, I would highly suggest treating your tree if you'd like to save it. The two most commonly used pesticides for emerald ash borer management are stem injection of emomectin benzoate. Um, that is a restricted use pesticide, but it lasts two to three years and it is much more effective than the other alternative. The bad part of that pesticide is that it can be quite expensive. It's about 10 to $15 per inch DBH to get a tree care company to come out and administer that treatment. The other option is something that landowners can do themselves. That's, this is a soil application of imidacloprid or dinotefuron. Um, you can go to Lowe's today, if it's not too icy, and pick up some of these pesticides and do a soil treatment um, on your ash. Now I recommend waiting till the leaves 
um, on your ash tree leaf out. That's the, the best time. Anytime that the tree is transpiring would be a good time to treat um, with imidacloprid or dinotefuron. Um, unfortunately, these are not as effective as, as emamectin benzoate. So if the tree is already infested, this may not be the best option. Um, and it has to um, have an annual retreatment to remain effective. So each year that it, it needs to be reapplied. Now, as a side note, there is a proposed Pollinator Protection Act um, in the North Carolina um, Senate, I believe now. Um, if this passes, which a lot of people believe will happen at some point, this would make neonicotinoid pesticides a restricted use pesticide. Imidacloprid and dinotefuron are both neonicotinoids. So that would mean that any homeowner could not go and pick that up at Lowe's anymore. You would need a pesticide license to be able to do that treatment. Here's an image showing um, a stem injection of emamectin benzoate. You can see it's basically like an IV. The tree slowly takes up the chemical that was mixed in this bottle. And this image shows a side-by-side -side of a healthy tree that was treated right next to one that was not treated. And you can see, obviously, using a pesticide can be quite effective. And here's just a quick image showing the bee protection bill that was filed in the NC House um, and at this point also the NC Senate. Another option for management of emerald ash borer is tree removal. Um, if you have an infested area and you want to prevent its spread, this is a viable option. Obviously, it depends on what your land use objectives are. Um, this is a scenario where we found emerald ash borer about 90 miles from the nearest known infestation. The infestation here, this was in Wayne County, um, seemed pretty early on. It was about half a mile from a campground. So at the time we thought we had caught the infestation early and that it was accidentally introduced by someone going to that campground and bringing firewood. So the North Carolina Forest Service, um, I was with the Forest Service at this time. Um, we came in and spent about three days cutting seven acres of pure ash at this site. And then all of the trees were burned. Um, unfortunately, a couple of months later, we found it upriver, um, and it seems that it has been there for a little bit longer than originally thought. But given the information we knew at the time, this was the best course of option. This was the best course, um, and it's also something that municipalities and towns consider greatly if they just simply don't have the budget to treat uh, proper or city or town-owned trees. Um, this is a a scenario in Rochester, New York, where their response was to remove infested trees. And the story with this one goes, these homeowners went to work one day, weren't told that the city's plan was to remove the trees, and this is what they came home to. So you can see the changes, vast changes that made to the neighborhoods. And again, kind of that solidifying the idea that you should diversify street plantings if you can. So if something comes through and kills one species, you don't lose the entire tree. There is a biological control program underway as well. This is not currently available to private landowners. This is something that is done um, on the national level. The federal um, USDA APHIS rears these pesticides and then, or these, sorry, these parasitoids, and then ships them to state cooperators. So at this point, we've released a little over 90,000 parasitoid wasps. You can see the most wasps were released in Granville County, and that was simply because they've been released there for quite some time. But it was also because at the time that those were being released, um, we thought Tetrasticus, which you can see 56,000 of were released, um, these wasps are much easier to rear than Spathius, um, but we thought they would be suitable for North Carolina. And the more we're doing research, we have an ongoing project um, right now looking at uh, what parasitoids are suitable for North Carolina. We're realizing that Tetrasicus is probably not a good fit for North Carolina. So we're no longer releasing them. You can see in Wake County, um, we haven't released any, Chatham County either, and we're even slowing down with that Forsyth County release. We are continuing to look for release sites. It's something that APHIS um, is taking on now. So if you think you have um, a property that may be a good fit for this program, then let me know and I'll forward it to the suitable people. And by the way, when I say parasitoid wasps, this is how tiny they are. A lot of people think they really look like gnats. I automatically say wasps and people freak out, but I assure you it's nothing to freak out about. They won't sting you. They only want to go after that emerald ash borer under the bark. 
This is a more recent map showing where Emerald Dashboard can be found. But really what I want to point out here is that this blue line was a previous federal quarantine for Emerald Dashboard. And I say previous because that for federal quarantine has now been lifted. About a month ago, um, the regulations were lifted. So that means this blue line has disappeared. Um, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily giving up. Um, and more so that they're concentrating their efforts on other management options. They don't think the quarantine has actually played a significant role in slowing down the spread, um, and it was requiring a lot of resources to maintain. So as with a lot of invasive insects, um, emerald ash borer can easily move in or on firewood. So we highly encourage anyone going camping, anyone who cuts down a tree to try to keep it local. Um, reduce the spread of um, emerald ash borer and other invasives. So now for the next poll, um, what do you think is the recommended distance in miles that untreated firewood should be moved? Wow, so a lot of you said less than five miles. That makes me happy to see that you really want to keep firewood very local. And I would agree with you that that's probably the best option. Um, our recommendation when people ask is to keep it within 50 miles of where the tree was cut. Um, I would prefer five miles, but I know sometimes that's just not possible. All right, so what do you do if you think you have EAB on your property or if you think you, you find it? Um, well, first of all, try to determine if EAB is known from your area. A lot of you already said yes, so you know that Emerald Ash Borer is in your county. Um, if you don't know, there are range maps posted on our website. Um, go to NC State Extension Forestry and click on Forest Health, or you can go to the North Carolina Forest Service Forest Health page um, and look at the map there. If you are in an area where Emerald Ash Borer has not yet been reported, um, then report it. This is one that we're still tracking in order to have the best management options available to people. Um, so take photos, I'll never transport samples. The last thing we wanna do is accidentally move Emerald Ash Borer to new areas. And then report it to either the Forest Service or you can report it directly to me and I'll make sure the right people know. If you are in an area where you know Emerald Ash Borer to occur, then it's time to consider your management options, whether that be treatments, if the tree is high value enough, whether it be removal um, or a harvest, depending on your situation and your um, land objectives. All right, switching gears to laurel wilt. Um, this is a disease that is um, a fungus and it is spread from tree to tree by a small beetle, the red bay ambrosia beetle. Now it attacks all, uh, or it can affect all species in the Lauraceae family, the laurel family, Primarily, this is Red Bay, um, but the reason why I am bringing it up at a Western North Carolina webinar is because it is increasingly attacking sassafras, um, although all members of Laraceae are susceptible. Um, Laurel wilt has already killed about half a billion Red Bay trees in the Southeast, and frankly, that number is a little bit old. It has continued to spread, and there has not been an analysis done on how many sassafras it's killed, um, and it is very clearly doing quite well in sassafras. This is a map showing where laurel wilt has been detected to date. Um, as you can see in North Carolina, it is restricted to this southeastern corner, just that coastal area. Um, primarily it's impacting Red Bay, but we are seeing it more and more in sassafras. But you'll notice um, last, I guess in 2019, it was detected in Tennessee and Kentucky for the first time. How it got there, we don't know. Um, we greatly suspect someone accidentally transported infested material, um, which is a little bit strange since Red Bay isn't really a, a high value timber species, but these things happen. A, a lot of these invasives, just like Whitney was talking about, just like Allison was talking about, can easily be transported accidentally from place to place. But I'm pointing this out also because there's two um, finds near the North Carolina, Tennessee state line. And to point out that really at any point, it could pop up in Western North Carolina. Um, it's obviously been found popping up miles and miles from other infested areas. 
time and time again. So keep an eye out for this and report it if you see it. This is a closer image showing where it's been found in southeastern North Carolina. Um, when I was with the Forest Service, we did annual surveys. Um, the Forest Health Branch continues to do those. Each time it is found in a new county, a specimen is sent to a lab to confirm that it is the pathogen. So next question, does laurel wilt occur in your county? I imagine a lot of you will say no, but we might have an errant person from either Tennessee or the coastal plains on here that knows exactly what I'm talking about with the mortality that laurel wilt is causing. Well, so some of you um, do have, do live in a county where laurel wilt occurs. Um, the majority of you know, you do not, which is not surprising. Um, hopefully you all continue to keep an eye out for it despite it not being found just yet. All right, so what do you look for? Um, one of the primary things that you will look for is the wilting foliage. On Red Bay, the trees retain this wilting foliage for quite some time, so it's kind of easy. Sassafras tends to lose those leaves a little bit quicker. But you basically just see this, this wilting occur and retained on the, on the trees. If you see this occurring, um, you may want to take a closer look at the tree. One of the things we see are the, what, what are referred to as frass toothpicks. So as ambrosia beetles bore into trees, um, they push the sawdust and mix with their excrement out of the tree um, because they're actually not wood feeders. They actually implant um, a spore of uh, fungi into the tree and then they feed on the fungus as it grows within the galleries of the tree. So because of that, they're pushing what they're excavating out of the tree and you can kind of see this perpendicular um, quote unquote frass toothpick um, coming out of the tree. That would indicate a very active infestation. Unfortunately, if there's a strong rain or a windstorm coming through, it might blow those off. So this isn't necessarily something you would have to see to think that it could still be laurel wilt. If you do suspect laurel wilt, I highly encourage you to strip some of the bark off the tree and see if it has this vascular streaking. That's a really good indication that it could be laurel wilt. And then if it's in a new county, um, we're gonna need a sample of that to send to the lab for confirmation. So the good news, management. Well, unfortunately, not a ton of good news here. In the forest setting, there's not really much that can be done. And that's primarily because Red Bay is just a low value species. It's not even used ornamentally. Its primary function is um, ecological. So not a ton of options. Um, although if there are landscape Red Bays, then those could be treated, um, or sassafras, then those could be treated with a fungicide. Now, because these, um, this disease can impact anything in the Lurace family, it can impact avocados. This isn't a problem here in North Carolina, obviously, but it is a problem in Florida. So they actually have a pretty cool system where they use drones and dogs. The dogs can smell out the pathogen um, several weeks before symptoms ever appear. And then they can treat that tree with systemic fungicides and actually prevent disease from occurring. So that is the good news. Um, you can continue to enjoy your um, avocados and guacamole if you would like. Um, so what can you do? Again, reduce the movement of infested material. The last time we one is for this to pop up in new areas and continue to spread. Um, we know the beetle will do it on its own, but it doesn't. We don't want to help it. There's an image of the dog. Um, they, this is a Bel Belgian Malinois type of dog and it um, smells the fungus out and then it sits at the base of the tree where it finds the pathogen. All right, the last invasive I'm going to talk about today is the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, this is one, again, it has not yet been detected in North Carolina, but it's now more on our radar than it has been ever before because it has been found in South Carolina this past summer. As the name suggests, it is native to Asia. It was first detected in Brooklyn in 1996. I um, mean, it, it has since spread from there and oftentimes spread accidentally by humans. So the first detection was in New York followed by a detection um, in Chicago, then back over here to New Jersey. Um, then it popped up in Ontario, Canada, then Massachusetts, and then lastly, Ohio. And before the find in South Carolina, Ohio was the southernmost 
um, extent of the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, the problem with Asian longhorn beetle, it, is, it has a pretty wide host range. Uh, maples, birch, willow, elm, horse chestnut, um, buckeye, mimosa, ash, poplar, all of these trees and more can be um, infested with the Asian longhorn beetle. However, maples are its favorite. And of maples, red maples tend to be its favorite. Those of you in the western part of the state, you've got a lot of red maple. It's the second most populous tree in our forest. So if this comes to North Carolina, it would be bad, bad news. Identification, this is what the beetle looks like. It is a beautiful beetle, uh, shiny black with white spots on it. Um, it gets up to one, one and a half inches long, so quite large for a beetle. And one of the things to look for is the antennae are black and white striped. That's a good way to um, have it stand out from other natives that, that are longhorn beetles. Now the larvae, there's not really a diagnostic character we can share. And frankly, they're hidden deep within um, the trees that they're infesting. So you probably wouldn't see it, um, but they are cream colored, they're legless, and they can get up to about two inches in length. Signs and symptoms, you'll see dieback in the canopy. You may also see coarse sawdust at the base of the tree um, or in uh, branch crotches, like where two branches join together. You can see it right here, how there's uh, sawdust from the um, entry and the creation of egg niches that the females created. Uh, speaking of egg niches, this is another thing to look for. So when females lay eggs, they chew these little divots in the bark, um, oval in shape, and then she will lay either one or two eggs in each one of those divots. You may also see round exit holes. As the beetles exit the tree, they make these almost perfectly round exit holes that are the exact size of a pencil. So if you have a pencil on you, stick it in that hole and it should be a perfect fit. Um, that's a pretty good indication that you need to be reporting that infestation has a possible Asian longhorn beetle. Here's some more images. You can see a closer image of one of those egg niches and the female um, going to town. Here's a cross section of a tree and you can see how large these internal galleries are and why they might be so disruptive to the transportation of water and nutrients within the tree and how they might also affect standing integrity. Um, because of this, you see a lot of branch, branches falling on newly infested trees, um, so something to be aware of. And then there in the background is a larva in a vial. All right, so let's talk about this South Carolina infestation for a little bit. Um, it was detected in Hollywood, South Carolina, which is just south of Charleston, and it's about 120 miles from the North Carolina state line. Now, how it got there, we don't know. Um, Hollywood is an area where a lot of people come to vacation. Um, a lot of people, you know, bring their trailers, may go camping there. There's also a, an interstate running nearby. There's also a railroad running nearby. Um, Charleston has a very large international port. So it's kind of all of these pathways, all these possible pathways are there and we don't exactly know how it got there. Now, that being said, the genetics of the South Carolina population do match those of the Ohio infestation, but we don't know if that necessarily moves that means that it was spread there or it was another introduction of the same population genetics. Um, hopefully it's something we can determine and maybe be able to prevent in the future. As of right now, the regulated area is just over 72 square miles, which is a pretty big area for a newly detected infestation. This includes almost 4,000 trees that have been determined to be infested with the, the Asian longhorn beetle. And doing dendrochronology studies, it's been determined that the Asian longhorn beetle has probably been there for at least eight years before it was reported. And the funny thing is, once they started talking to the community where it was for, first reported from, someone else mentioned, oh, I saw that beetle last year by the pool. And so it kind of just goes to show how important it is to report something um, if it's something you've never seen before and it's a, if it's a possible invasive. The good news with this one is eradication does work. Um, eradication of these pop-up populations of Asian longhorn beetle have been successful on multiple occasions. The Chicago infestation is now eradicated. The New Jersey infestation is now eradicated. The one in Eastern Queens, the one in um, uh, Staten Island, Manhattan, um, Boston, Massachusetts, you can see the areas that are in red, um, still, still have an active infestation, but they're 
clearly working at it and trying to eradicate it from those areas. So we can't say that about most invasives that eradication works. Um, the bad news about eradication working is that it doesn't look that great. This is a before photo in Worcester, Massachusetts, and they came in. Um, eradication is essentially removing all of the host trees of Asian longhorn beetle. So this is the after photo of this um, incident. And again, I cannot say it enough. Um, we highly recommend replanting with diverse species, although Asian longhorn beetle has a pretty wide host range. So not sure how helpful it would have been in this scenario. So keep an eye out. Um, if you do see Asian longhorn beetle, please report it. This is the same bad bug email that Whitney shared with us earlier for spotted lanternfly. Um, you can also contact me directly, um, contact the Forest Service if that's your more comfortable route. Um, but use that bad bug email like Whitney suggested. Um, send a photo if you can. Um, use a size reference um, and they will respond very quickly. This is one that we want to know as soon as possible because the earlier we know about an infestation, the um, more successful that an eradication attempt will be. So please, please, please report it. And I will end with that this lasting side note about firewood or about any material really. Um, firewood is kind of considered the Trojan horse for invasive forest pests. So if you know the story of the Trojan horse, um, they brought this horse in and armies were hiding inside. It's the same story with um, firewood. It may look innocent on the outside, but if you peel up bark, like in this case right here, um, this, this firewood is riddled with emerald ash borer galleries. Before we ever found emerald ash borer in North Carolina, we had a similar event. Um, take place where infested material was shipped to North Carolina. And fortunately, it ended up in an area where there wasn't much ash nearby. So it didn't take hold then. Um, but obviously, we know how the story went from there. So please encourage those that you speak with, please, um, if you yourself camp, try not to spread firewood more than 50 miles. Try to wait until you get there or use heat treated or kiln dried firewood. And with that, I will leave you with my email, um, a short entomological um, comic about washing your hands during this time of COVID. Just be grateful you're not a millipede. Um, I'm also putting um, my Twitter account on there in our uh, Facebook page. Um, I encourage you to follow us if you're on Twitter and or Facebook. Um, see what's going on in the world of forest health. We'll regularly post updates. So that's a really good way to keep up with us. And then there's the our NC State uh, Forestry Extension Forest Health page website right there. And with that, I will open it up to any questions. Looks like I can probably go right to the um, question and answer session. All right, so have any resistant ash trees been found? Um, Jim, that is a very good question. The short answer is we think so. Um, the US Forest Service is doing some research. They've identified what's been dubbed lingering ash. So these are ash that are surviving in the wake of a mortality wave of emerald ash borer. And we're starting to see similar things in North Carolina. I'm actually having a graduate student start in the fall investigating the same thing um, in North Carolina. So hopefully we can identify some native trees um, that have some level of resistance. And if not, then maybe they can be bred or engineered for resistance. So great question. All right, next question. If wasps are successful, why are more not being released? Um, Sam, the, the answer there is um, prohibitive, um, I guess the, the cost prohibitive aspect of it, but also how the infrastructure works. Um, we did not get nearly as many wasps this year as we thought we would, largely due to COVID and lab restrictions that they had. These are currently only being reared in APHIS labs. Um, so that's why it, it's something that we basically have to rely on their ability to produce them. Now, when I say it's cost prohibitive, um, it's very expensive to rear things in a lab setting. Um, when we get wasps sent to us, the approximate cost is about two to three dollars per wasp. So if you can see we released over 90,000 wasps, you can see that that can be quite expensive. 
anywhere in the cost share for EAB treatments for municipal areas like we had last year getting more funding? Um, good question, Joe. So when I was with the Forest Service, um, we started the ash protection program. Um, that program still has money in it for this year. Um, the Forest Health Branch will continue to operate that. So I assume um, I would touch base with Rob Trickle if that announcement hasn't gone out quite yet um, and, and see when those announcements and call for um, applications will be going out. But yes, the, the, when I left the Forest Service, the program man, money was still there and there were still plans to operate into 2021. All right, is there any current organized effort to ask for a forestry exception to the proposed restricted use of neonics similar to the white paper that was produced a few years ago by the Southern Group of State Foresters? Um, good question, Margo. Um, I'm not sure. I think a lot of us are kind of waiting to see if this actually gets passed. This was actually introduced, I think, three years ago at this point. And at the time, we were told that it would very likely pass. Um, but it hasn't yet. Maybe everyone's distracted by COVID and <laughs> it won't it won't become a big deal. But that's it's a really good question because the issues with neonicotinoids are largely due to agricultural use um, and impacts on um, you know mistreatments and treatments on trees that are pollinated by insects. And that's just not the case with ash, with hemlock, um, with all these other things that we're using them for. Any pesticide treatment for Asian longhorn beetle? Um, Rebecca, that's a good question. It has been looked at as I'm actually starting a project um, with a current graduate student trying to look at an herbicide treatment to kill host trees. But the short answer is not yet. And that's simply because the current goal is eradication. So we're not trying to manage it at this point. We are still trying to get rid of it. Once um, or, if Asian longhorn beetle does become established and we start looking at management instead of eradication, then there might be increased research on what landowners can do um, to treat their trees. There might be increased interest in biocontrol, but right now we're trying to eradicate them, get rid of every single one. Um, and to date, um, pesticide studies into the pesticides to accomplish this have not been successful. Is there any data on the impact of the forest products industry due to emerald ash borer? Um, Craig, not, not that I am aware of. We know that um, it is basically going through and wiping out many ash trees, but I am not aware of an economic analysis. Um, I do think that one should be done um, in the forest setting, at least in North Carolina. Ash only makes up 2% of our forest, so it's not a huge industry here. Um, it's a much bigger problem in the Midwest where they can have near 100% stands of ash, um, but it is, that is a very good question and I wish I had an answer for you on that. All right, awesome. Thank you so much for the very thoughtful questions. Um, we will have, looks like a three minute break. Uh, our next speaker is Paul Merton and he will be talking about pine bark beetles um, and he will begin at 1030. So if you need to get a quick drink, um, go ahead and do that. And Paul will start at 1030. For bark beetles. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you, Kelly. Good morning, y'all. Um, hopefully you did okay with this ice storm. Um, glad we have power. So I'm going to get off uh, talk today about uh, kind of for bark beetles, and I'm going to diverge a little bit from this other speakers that all of these are natives. So some of you, I'm going to start right out of the gates with a poll question is, do you all own or manage land with a si significant amount of for, uh, pine cover? Whoops, I got a different, a wrong poll question there. There we go. This one should be an easy, easy answer for you guys. Okay, all right, well, about half of you. All right, well, good. That will, um, will segue into my presentation, if it will work. Um, 
I seem to be locked up, Kelly. Try clicking on your PowerPoint and then hitting next. There we go. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk about nine species here today. The, the most important ones are the first five or actually the most, most important are the first four. Some of you guys are guys and gals that are gray haired or no haired. Um, probably this is gonna be a primer for you, but I noticed in the list that there's a lot of people that I've never, I don't know. So hopefully this is new information for y'all. Um, the bark beetles that we have the guild, the biggest tree killers are the Ips, Southern Pine Beetle and uh, Black Turpentine Beetle. As you can see that their locations are somewhat uh, aligned within the tree as in this, this chart. And I'm gonna go into those a little bit here. We have the size and if you look at Southern Pine Beetle, Dendroxinus frontalis, it looks like a puny little thing, but it's actually the biggest uh, killer here. Um, in general, pine bark beetles, they like some type of plant physiological stress. Drought, fires, hurricanes, lightning strikes, maybe ice like today, um, flooding, or other anthropogenic things like trenching or, or house building or, or management with uh, mature or overstocked stems. Some of the things that you'll see from the exterior signs is uh, trees fading and you'll see pitch tubes, you'll see um, different characteristics. And what I'm gonna go through and hopefully parse through all those that you can uh, detect them uh, readily. And also in, in order to really find out what, you're, what insect you're dealing with, you have to peel some bark. So with that, you can find the galleries and the insect itself and you can definitively tell what kind of insect in problem that we're dealing with. The first one I'm gonna go into is Southern Pine Beetle. This is the big one. It kills, it's, it's the most aggressive and destructive of the pine bark beetles in, in Southern uh, United States. It is a native, usually have outbreaks about seven to 10 years. Out West here, usually the outbreak intervals are, are, are a little longer or shorter, depending on the part of the region you are. Um, the native range, this is an old um, uh, graphic, but it's still, pretty accurate. The, uh, the exception is in the last few years, we've been getting events way up in Massachusetts. So out of what we typically would know as the, the native range, we've, we've been getting Southern Pine Beetle activity. If you look at this map of the occurrence for the last 60 years of how many times that we've been in outbreak status, if you look at, at, uh, at the Western part, you can see in the Piedmont area, there's kind of, it's the little leaf section where there's a lot of short leaf pine. We have more intervals of Southern pine beetle. And also far Western North Carolina and Eastern Tennessee, we have a section where there's a lot more of the um, short leaf and you know, pines, but we have occur occurrences of Southern pine beetle more frequently. So this insect, it's kind of, as I said, it's, it's one, some people would say it's a puny little innocuous beetle. And if you look at it, it's a tiny one eighth inch beetle. It is very small, um, but it can have quite a um, disastrous impact on the environment. For those, if you're, if you extract the beetle, if you look at the posterior of it, it, it is uh, convex shaped. And this is very key because it's gonna be very different than the Ips beetle I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. That's a good way if you dig it out of a out of a tree and you find it and it has that that posterior section like that 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 is a good sign you have a southern pine beetle. Life cycle I'm going to go through very short, but it goes through a complete metamorphosis. It goes through five uh, four larval stages. Um, the generations take about um, 26 to 54 days, depending on the temperature. And generally the temperature at Southern Pine Beetle is somewhat, I like to say it's, it likes activity is the highest is when you are most comfortable in the woods. So say probably from 65 to 85 degrees, you will get the highest uh, activity or in the fastest development. And as it gets warmer or colder, you'll get developmental drop off. Usually there's, um, about three to five generations, and depending on where you are in the Western North Carolina. In first emergence, you'll see is about when the red buds start to bloom in the spring. So how they work. So it's, as I said, it's a tiny little beetle. How in the devil does it really kill a tree? It does it by 
um, initiating attack, uh, mostly with, with southern pine beetles, the females that start attack and they locate a tree that they, they smell um, that it seems suitable that they can attack it. If it's successful, they mass attack it and power in numbers, thousands of beetles attack a tree and they can overcome its um, resin duct uh, natural response. And then in time, the, uh, the, the uh, subsequent attacks, they start girdling the tree and the phloem tissue is disrupted. Southern pine beetle also carries an ophiostoma fungus, which creates a, uh, disrupts the, uh, the water uh, movement within the tree. As you can see in the lower slide, it's a, a blue stain fungi. Indicators. So the difference, it's, it's so there's some things that are subtle and some not so. If you're looking, uh, if they're trying to tell what kind of beetle is killing your trees, with southern pine beetle, if you look at the lower left image, you'll see like an area where it's older damage and then a head, a movement of, of, of the beetle. That's very common for southern pine beetle. You will see that from aerial views or even from a mountaintop view. Getting closer, you go up to the tree stem itself, you'll see that you'll see whitish um, pitch tubes along, mostly along the crevices of the bark. And, um, and then also in the lastly, if you see shot holes or just holes with absence of pitch tube, those are usually exit holes of a tree that's vacated. Okay, as I said in the earlier slide, they usually, the, the damage you usually see a, 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 a dis, a distinct head of movement where you see dead trees to yellow tree or dead trees to red trees to yellow trees to just kind of off color green trees. And then when you peel a bark, you see these sinuous S shaped galleries. That's very diagnostic for Southern pine beetle. <clears throat> Susceptible stands, it's pretty much all of the conifers that we have here in Western North Carolina. They particularly like shortleaf and Virginia pine, but pretty much anything is game if you have high enough population. They tend to be a bigger problem in dense and, over, dense and overstocked stands and very old and low vigor stands. And as I said before in the beginning with the pine beetles that of something that where there's been some type of, of damage to the stem that's predisposed the host. All right, switching gears. Now I'm gonna talk about the three Ips engraver beetles. And these all attack different parts of the tree. Um, they're kind of gradated, the, the, the larger ips, um, calligraphus, it's usually in the bottom part of the tree. Um, Grandiculus is in the middle part of the tree and avulsus is in usually up in the tree top in the live crown. Now note, remember I said with a southern pine beetle, it had a con, convex uh, posterior. The ips beetles have kind of, it looks like somebody's bit a chunk out of their tail end. They're concave looking. That's a huge diagnostic, diagnostic um, um, uh, attribute of these species. All right, how this one, Ips can be, they are the second most destructive pest of southern pines in the, in, in the in southern United States. Um, and they can, the, the range is roughly the same as southern pine beetle. It, it, it's in general, it's the, the range of, of, of the yellow pines. Um, and as it, they, they also attack the same host, pretty much southern pine beetle. Infestations from Ips beetles usually are coincident after an extreme drought in, uh, event, or if you're down east, a hydric, if you have too much water, it's a oxygen part with the roots. Um, and also Ips beetles are, they readily colonize uh, slash. So if you have, a lot of uh, uh, pine volatiles floating about. Ips beetles are, are, they gravitate towards those. The life cycle of Ips beetles is, is quite similar to uh, the southern pine beetle. It has one, one less larval stage, but, but pretty close. The time of development of the, uh, the two larger Ips is, is roughly equivalent to southern pine beetle as well. Can be as 25 to days to a, a, a 20, 54 or greater. Ips of is a small one, it reproduces much faster. It, in, in, prop, in the opportune temperatures, it can reproduce in 18 days, 18 days, it's pretty fast. Um, you can get a lot of beetles in that time. Ips beetles, how they diverge from 
uh, southern pine beetles, they like hot weather. They can operate up to temperatures of about 103 degrees. So hot, dry weather is that's their that's their groove. They really they do quite well in that environment. The galleries, they're distinctly different than southern pine beetle, and this is great for diagnostics after you peel bark. The two larger Ips beetles will have I, Y, or H-shaped galleries, and the smaller, the Ips of Alsus, has usually an I shape that they're oriented vertically with the main stem. Okay, how did how did these guys kill the tree? The Ips beetles are a little different in that, that males initiate attack versus the females on southern pine beetles. They are attracted to host volatiles and they bore in through the tree and they 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 uh they stop the phloem tissue, uh, a movement of, of nutrients, very exactly the same as in Southern Pine Beetle, actually. Uh, and they also carry blue stain fungi as Southern Pine Beetle. So the mode of killing it, basically the same as Southern Pine Beetle. Okay, the, here's the subtle differences that you'll see in the environment that uh, with Ips beetles, uh, the two larger Ips, um, they usually kill about one to 10 trees in a little clump, and then there'll be uninfested trees, and then there'll be another clump. They're kind of a, a, a salt and pepper in the landscape, if you uh, can en envision. They have, in the Ips of Alsus, often, if you look in this middle image, they kill, in, in good times anyway, they kill just a branch, so you see flagging. Ips beetles have more of a pinkish or reddish um, pitch tube, and they are usually in the bark plates, not in the fissures. Ips engravers, the, the bigger, the larger Ips, the four and five, or five and six spined uh, Ips beetles. As I said, they have the I, Y, or H shaped galleries, depending on how many females that male has, has attracted. You will see just clumps, a few, one, two, three trees, and then green trees, one, two, three trees. You'll see spots throughout your stand in bad times and bad drought times, or if your if your stand has been thin. The Ips of Alsus is a little different. Um, again, it has just a it's a it's a much smaller beetle. It, its pattern is usually I shaped. It just goes straight up and down the stem, and usually you just see some top uh, lagging. <clears throat> in extreme cases, though, Ips of Alsus, the small Ips, can act and look almost like southern pine beetle as we had a it, and this is kind of a more rare event but it does happen we had one down in Oconee Georgia in 2016 that um, uh, I think it was 80 acres were in were killed so it had a beetle spot very much like a southern pine beetle but it was purely ips of ulcers. next poll question have I uh, been helpful in getting you guys to be able to differentiate those or beetle species. And if you all say yes, I'm gonna just quit this at the presentation and be done because you guys are up to speed. Um, kidding, of course, but, <clears throat> and we got the numbers coming in. Sweet, 99%, man, I gotta send that to my boss. Thanks, um, well, good. That, uh, Okay, the, of the suite of, of, of killers, of pine beetle, or of pine killers, the next one I'm gonna talk is the black turpentine beetle. This one's big, he's about a quarter, quarter to three eighths of an inch in length. It looks almost exactly like southern pine beetle uh, with an unaided um, uh, examination, except for it's, it's big, it's, it's considerably bigger. Hosts are similar, they, 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 it's any yellow pine. I've seen them actually in white pine pretty bad as well. They're generally considered a secondary pest and they often follow the Ips and Southern pine beetles. So it uh, usually is not a tree killer, but it can kill trees. And uh, black turpentine beetle does not vector the opiostoma, the blue stain fungi. You'll see this one. Uh, black turpentine beetles in the lower portion of the tree, usually from the ground level to about 10 feet. It's gregarious. It has a bunch of little, uh, uh, they, they stay together. They won't eat each other like the other two, uh, four species. Um, they'll hang together in a clump. 
and the pitch tubes are huge. If you could look at the uh, a quarter up against it, they're, the pitch tubes are quite big. They look very much like Southern Pine Beetle, but just magnified, they're much larger. These guys usually attack, as I mentioned before, of, of trees that are already in attack by the other Ipsen Southern Pine Beetle. But they can also attack from um, damage along the, the, like if you skin the side of a tree from mechanical injury. All right, now I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do some myth busting on you a little bit. But there's some things that some people believe to be true that uh, maybe not so. And then the, the segue into that, I'm gonna talk about the Pine Sawyer Beetle. Early literature, back in the 20s, they used to say it was a tree killer. Um, that literature no longer exists. They don't really say that. In general, what we see with Pine Sawyer Beetle, it's a big longhorn beetle, kind of looks like the Asian longhorn beetle Kelly talked about. Um, it um, attacks trees that are already under attack, and they actually smell the pheromone plume of the southern pine beetle. They come in, they, they, they come in and kind of clean up the, 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 uh, the aftermath. Um, and these are the ones that if you're in a woods in a real quiet day, you can actually hear them sawing um, into the xylem. Um, but in general, this tree, th this pest, it attacks trees and you'll find it in every pine that's been attacked, but it's kind of a secondary. It's coming in later into the party. Another one that we find occasionally, and this one can kill uh, eastern white pine, and, and I've, I've seen it in pole timber and loblolly pine, that this one, uh, the uh, Pisodes nemorensis, it is a weevil, and if you look at the, the nose of it, uh, all weevils look similar to that. And also, if you peel bark and you see a chip cocoon in a conifer, you probably are dealing with the eastern pine weevil. This guy can be a killer, usually is very localized and it's often more your open grown trees. If you guys go do yard tree things, you might see this, this critter. Um, and it usually is worse when you have uh, late summer droughts, you'll have uh, um, upticks of this beetle. Okay, the, this one, many people say it's a tree killer, the ambrosia beetles. Remember Kelly talked about the laurel wilt, um, disease and then and the ambrosia beetle kills it. Ambrosias, they usually have, they're very, um, they have a, a host or two that they attack. They're very specific. And, and pine ones are to some extent as well. These are aftermath uh, insect as well. They come into a dead or dying tree and they're subject, you can see that if you look at the base of the tree and you see uh, uh, sawdust or it looks, it's, it's like consistency of, of flour. If you see that, you're probably seeing ambrosia beetle injury, which it's again, it's coming in way late to the party, really not killing the tree or influencing it in any way. Um, and the last one I'm going to talk about, this is the good guy. This is the, the, uh, the savior for a lot of uh, pine beetle uh, outbreaks, and it's the checker beetle. And uh, this one, it is a predator in its larval and adult stage and it eats ifs and uh, southern pine beetle. Um, when you see the presence of this in an area and you see a lot of them, that's a great sign. That means that your um, a bark beetle outbreak is probably collapsing. All right, I wish I could talk about a, uh, uh, control measures and a lot of other things about bark beetles. I could talk for hours literally about these, but uh, I don't have the time. Southern pine beetle control measures, there are some, which is good. And mostly the best one is salvage, just get the, the damaged material out of the woods. Cut and leave can be used. It has, it's, uh, it, it's hit and miss. Um, if you have any questions with that, talk to your consultant or, or North Carolina Forest Service forester and they can get you up to speed. Ips and graver beetle control measurements, measures is a little bit different than Southern pine beetle in that Fell and leave does not work. Remember I talked about Ips beetles that they come into the, the host volatiles, the uh, 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 turpentine um, uh, aromas, that they, they will draw into it. So if you fell trees to, to kill the beetles that are in it, you're gonna just attract more. It does not work. Um, so the only thing you really can do with Ips is if you can just sit on your hands and take it, and if you get damage that usually people, most uh, foresters say 25% mortality and then just liquidate the span. So not as many options with, with a bad IPS 
uh, and grave repeat outbreak. Prevention is our best um, um, tactic that we have from that, and it's it works and it works and it works. So I I know I looked at the list, and some of you guys in North Carolina Forest Service folks, you guys have been preaching this for years, and right on, you're you're on the mark. Um, you want to thin your high hazard stands. We found that uh, in a U.S. Forest Service study that most stands that got attacked were actually 20 to 40 years old. They weren't really old, old trees. And they got attacked if unthinned stands that were 20 to 40 years got uh, impacted the, the worst. Um, for prescribed fire, it helps open the stand, it works. Resistant species, the right tree for the right spot, obvious, right? Um, and if harvest, don't let your trees get too old. And anything, when it's lower in vigor, it's, it's a more attractive thing for many insects. And um, uh, in yard trees, there are some preventative uh, insecticides, but very minimal in uh, application. We found that in research, about 80 square feet of basal area is about what you want to target for, um, for your pines. And at that place, it, it usually works quite well for um, disrupting the pheromone plume in southern pine beetles. And what's happening is you get uh, more ventilation in the in, in the within the crown. Most southern pine beetles are attacking about 20, 20 feet to about the live crown. Um, you get more ventilation and movement of air, and it breaks this the pheromone that that they, they mass attack, they use to mass attack. And um, it 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 helps uh, lower the, the population buildup versus a real thick canopy. You get, uh, well, if you guys have been in a dead of summer in a thick canopy, the air does not move at all. So it, that's, that's um, not good for your prevention. As I said, the plume, pheromone plumes, ideally, if they, the research is about 20 feet between trees is ideal. If you have that much space, usually you have the ventilation. And of course, don't beat up your trees. You know, your bumper trees, your, your wounded trees, it's best to get rid of those because they are um, attractants for other beetles. And of course, um, for BTB, don't pile up uh, pine up against live trees or, or ips as well. You'll, you'll bring in um, uh, more beetles to uh, attack your live trees. And my, my last poll question, if you own or manage land with pine stands, have these stands been thinned? The questions are coming in. Wow, that's... Um, Encouraging, I guess. Um, I know that we have a lot, especially in Western North Carolina, have a problem with with um, thinning, getting thinnings happening. So it's encouraging to see about half are thin. That's great. Um, uh, that's encouraging. Uh, definitely thin, thin, thin. That's our best uh, of the prevention or the, the suppression methods are second. Uh, rate compared to prevention. Thinning is by and far and above the way to go. So keep keep thinning, guys. Um, all right, to summate, I'm going to uh, talk about where these beetles are. Remember that, that pretty graphic in the beginning? It had the turpentine beetles down in the bottom. Your six fine ips beetles are kind of along the main bowl. Uh, southern pine beetle is usually in the main stem, usually about 20 feet. So if you're looking for early infestations, look 20 feet, don't look at two meters or eye level. Um, and then the five spine is, is about the same place in the up into the live crown. And then your four spine is up, usually up in the tree crown. And the characteristics of it, Southern pine beetle, remember has the S shaped galleries. They have the creamy white, white to yellow pitch tubes that are in the crevices, and they carry blue stain. It has the I, Y, or H shaped galleries, and they have the pink to reddish pitch tubes that are generally on the bark plates, and they also carry blue stain. And the black turpentine beetle is a uh, D shaped category, categories, the big excavations, and they're they're just they're just 
it, it looks like a giant southern pine beetle and they are really low on the tree. So I think, yeah, that has it. So if there's any questions, Kelly, I cannot see them on my screen, so. Thanks for that awesome presentation, Paul. If anyone has any questions, go ahead and put them in the question and answer box now. Um, I don't see any currently in there, Paul, but we'll give a couple minutes and see if any show up. Um, Jill, if you wanna go ahead and prepare and get ready for sharing your presentation in a couple of minutes. Okay, well, we're waiting for it. Whitney, I wanna shout out to you for helping me with that spotted lantern fly question early minutes before you had to go on this morning. That's, that's awesome, thank you. Oh, absolutely, happy to help, Paul. It's, it was just so, just in time entomology, it's amazing. Perfect. <laughs> We did have one question come in, uh, Paul. When was the last outbreak of any of these beetles? That's a great question. I didn't mention that. We had a probably a 50 year event here in Western North Carolina back in 1998 to 2003. And that one was huge. It looks like about 1950 to 52, there was a similar event, but, but just, unheard of to us most of you know of our lifetime and our career professionals um lately we have we have had some southern pine beetle in western north carolina in the last uh four years and we've had eps too uh and as well as georgia and south carolina close to us um so that's it, in in the mountains we it, it depends if you're in the a higher elevation white pine region, you probably won't see bark beetles. The intervals will be 20 or 30 years. They're not as quite as common, but when they do happen, they can be quite uh, impressive. So, but then again, remember from that one map, the Southern pine beetles way out far west, uh, um, like in uh, Murphy in that area over there, where you get a lot more, it's lower elevation and you get more yellow pines, the occurrence intervals there more often. And we, and we have seen them at, in the last four years. All right, two more questions came in. Paul, um, would coupling prescribed fire with those thinning treatments provide additional prevention for beetles? Yes, it does. That's a good question. I, I had it on my slide, but I, I was uh, pushed for time with this, that prescribed fire does add uh, the benefit that if you control your understory tree uh, species that you have more ventilation in that stand. So if you kill your, your understory um, uh, trees, um, it does break the pheromone plume for southern pine beetle. All right, follow up to that. Do you see similar outbreaks after prescribed fires may have been a little too hot? Do you have any recommendations for some <laughs> prescribed burning timing in relation to minimizing beetle impacts? That is a, yeah, that's, that's a, a great question and it comes up. Um, yes, it can be if you get uh, like a, um, a, a, a jackpot spot, you know, where you, you scorch trees and stuff, you can start a southern pine beetle outbreak or ifs. Um, it's a little controversial with ifs if it, if it, it impacts it or not, but uh, in general, you don't want to beat up or stress your stands when you have bark beetles around. Because um, they're kind of, they're opportunistic. They're looking for something that they, you know, the, the weak will the beast in the herd, if you will. So a scorched tree would be a compromise. Awesome. Thanks for that great presentation, Paul. Um, we are now going to switch to another um, conifer specialist, Jill Sidebottom. Um, she is with NC State Extension, and she is going to talk about some Western North Carolina conifer pests. So Jill, I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks. We'll see if we can get the screen up here. Um, okay, I hope everybody can see that. Um, I uh, work in Western North Carolina um, almost exclusively with Christmas trees, but also uh, work with hemlocks and other conifers in the forests and get a lot of homeowner calls from people who are having issues with uh, their favorite tree in the yard. Uh, and conifers are very important in Western North Carolina. They make up important forest communities like the spruce fir forests on the tops of our highest mountains. Uh, again, they're very important in the landscape. People have a lot of love for those trees. 
And the Christmas tree industry is very important in the mountains. Uh, we have about 4,000 acres of, um, or 40,000 acres of uh, Fraser fir, and um, it's uh, a big industry uh, in our area, important to a lot of people. Um, and conifers are kind of, um, um, they're a little bit more peculiar, a little bit um, maybe crankier about where they live. Many grow in areas that other trees can't, so there are already issues with stress. Um, often they're slower growing, so they have a harder time outgrowing problems or, or um, getting beyond that problem. Um, and many are particular about the site that they grow on, so they don't handle change well. And as you've heard in all the uh, other talks that we've had before, and if you're ever doing anything with forest health, of course we realize that our introduced pests tend to be our worst problems. Um, but then also the climate changes that uh, we're experiencing uh, are, are greatly going to impact these pests and our tree's ability to withstand them. Um, if it becomes too warm, it becomes too wet, uh, that can create a lot of issues. Um, plus, there's a lot of added, added stress these days from just the increase of land use in the area as the mountains become a more and more popular place for tourism and other activities. For instance, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I saw a, a problem in some hemlocks. These were 20 and 30 foot hemlocks that a, a landowner had on property that they, they'd they had for many years, never had a problem before, but we saw this Rosalinia needle blight on them um, because it was so wet that year. We had about double the amount of rainfall. So that can create some, some problems that kind of surprise us all. So today uh, I wanted to talk about some of the things that I see and questions that I get asked a lot about going to spend a lot of time talking about hemlock woolly, woolly adelgid because of its important, but also because it, it's a really good example on, on the work that's being done and how to handle some of these issues. Uh, I want to briefly mention uh, some decline in white pines that we see in the area and then touch on a couple of Christmas tree pests that also have impacts in our forests. So hemlock woolly adelgid is one of those introduced pests. I'm sure you've heard of it before. It's a small bodied insect with piercing and sucking mouth parts. And if you look at that bottom photograph, and Kelly, I think that might be your photograph. But anyway, that long twisty thing that's hanging down from its little legs is its feeding tube, which is longer than, than its body. Um, so that's pretty amazing that they can utilize that inside the plant um, to survive. And it causes a reduced growth in the tree and eventual death of our East Coast hemlocks. And just to compare the difference between aphids and adelgids when talking with landowners, homeowners especially, most everybody has seen aphids on, oh, their rose bushes or, or something like that. Aphids, uh, and they're very similar insects, but aphids continue to move around probing for food. Um, but adelgids, they are stationary. So even though they still have uh, the legs that you can see, a few little legs sticking out from that adelgid there, um, once they uh, crawl or settles down in place and sticks that very long feeding tube into the plant, it's not gonna move again. So it's stationary like a scale insect is. We do have a native adelgid in our area, the pine bark adelgid, and it typically doesn't become a problem. So on this branch of this white pine is practically white. Each one of those spots uh, covers an insect. Um, but again, the, the, the pest has co-evolved with the tree, so it seldom causes a problem. We do see an issue in nurseries or in Christmas trees, smaller plants that are being intensively grown, if this pest comes in, uh, we do suggest that growers control it. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's much less of a problem. So what does an infested hemlock look like? Well, the first thing you're going to see are these little white balls. Uh, and they're always going to be at the base of the needle, where that needle attaches to the stem. So each one of those is covering an insect. Um, and uh, that's what you oftentimes first see. As the adelgids keep feeding on the tree, 
the tree quits growing well and you'll have needle loss and poor growth as pictured here. And in the woods, the, the trees have kind of a ghostly appearance to them. Um, now, uh, trees impacted by hemlock woolly adelgid will regrow, but like this tree that was in the woods, um, uh, the canopy will be thin. Um, and eventually, as uh, those cycles of feeding continue, uh, the tree will die. So here's some side-by-side uh, -side photographs from the Limville Falls um, observation point. Uh, the one is from 2001 before we really had much impact from hemlock woolly delgia. That's when we were first finding it in the mountains. Um, and you can see how beautiful the hemlocks look all around the falls. And then a photograph from 2010, and basically you go you go back there now, and and um, there's there are some hemlocks that are doing well because they're treating uh, for the adelgid, but there is a lot of impact. A lot of trees have died in our area, but if you think about it, hemlock woolly adelgid has been here for about 20 years, and we still have a lot of hemlocks that are out there. Um, and people have been successfully treating them on their property. So uh, sort of like what Kelly was saying, it's not all doom and gloom, um, and hopefully we can make some progress in this area. Of course, we do have two species of hemlocks in Western North Carolina. The most common is the Eastern hemlock, and uh, the Carolina hemlock is found more in uh, like rockier outcroppings and uh, a little bit more um, uh, restricted habitat. Uh, the big difference is the eastern hemlocks, those needles lay flat um, out sort of on either side uh, of the stem. And in Carolina hemlock, those needles are um, at different angles coming up from the stem. That's an easy way to tell them apart. The hemlock woolly, woolly adelgid has two generations per year. One is kind of a, a, a quick uh, generation, the one that occurs in the spring and summer, uh, and the other one is much slower, but basically they each generation does about the same thing. The eggs hatch to a crawler, which has to settle onto a, a feeding site um, uh, and stick its feeding tube in, and then those nymphs will um, molt in place. There's um, uh, four instars of the nymphs. Uh, and then they molt into the adult. In the United States, we don't have any males that are produced. So all the, the eggs that are laying by the adult are clones of, of the mother. Um, and on the life cycle in the progridians um, generation, uh, you can see there's supposed to be a wing adult that flies to an alternate host, which we don't have. And that's where males would be produced. Um, and so, uh, we just have females in the United States. So the, the timing of when the spokes of this wheel and the, the different months of the year can be modified and certainly are modified depending on the weather that year, depending on your location, if you're at a low elevation or high elevation, if you're off the mountain, uh, whatever. And um, I went out and looked at, I have a few hemlocks in, on my property. I live in Bakersville, North Carolina in uh, Mitchell County. And um, so right now, my population are adults which haven't started to lay eggs yet. Here are some photographs showing the different uh, stages, the eggs. Uh, and they always say it's an egg sac that's produced. It's not really a sac, I don't know. It's just a, a, a bunch of uh, waxy filaments that uh, cover the the adult so that it's protected from predators coming in and feeding on it. Um, but there'll be many, many eggs in uh, laid behind her. They will cratch, um, hatch to these crawlers as pictured here. Uh, the next um, photograph of the nymph, uh, and that would be that uh, estivating nymph that's gonna be resting in the fall. And you can see they're all at the base of the needle. Um, and that's the only place that you're going to find them on the plant. They're not going to be anywhere else on the shoot. They're not going to be on the, um, the, the needles themselves. They will molt in place and plump up as the maturing uh, nymphs into the adults. And that's what they're doing now. And then the adults will be laying eggs to complete the cycle. 
So there are many control strategies for hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, there are quarantines in the United States. We don't have any in North Carolina. And those quarantines greatly impacted our um, nurserymen in Western North Carolina as uh, when hemlock woolly adelgid first came into our area. Uh, it used to be that hemlocks were the bread and butter of our nursery industry in Western North Carolina. Everyone grew hemlocks. Uh, they sh shipped them throughout the Northeast and Midwest um, and uh, states that didn't have HWA at that time, didn't want those plants and understandably so. So it, it did greatly affect our industry here in Western North Carolina. Biological control is a big control strategy, and a lot of time and effort has been spent um, with that, uh, looking at predators, um, uh, which are brought in from other areas of uh, North America and, and around the world. Um, but breeding resistant hemlocks is another strategy that's being looked at and worked on, which is a type of biological control. Also cultural practices. Um, there's research going on looking at uh, opening up the canopy. Um, what people have observed and found is that hemlock woolly adelgid doesn't like sunlight. And so if you have trees that are in full sun, uh, they tend to not to have as much adelgid on them. They tend to grow a lot better and do a lot better. Um, even though hemlocks are a tree that, that grows well in the shade, uh, if it's infested with HWA, it grows better in full sunlight. So that's uh, one cultural practice that can be used. Um, and for people who have hemlocks in the landscape, not over fertilizing them is an important strategy because that fertilizer um, uh, uh, makes the tree uh, it, uh, a better host for the insect. Then there are many uh, chemical controls in the landscape, uh, soaps and oils, contact materials such as bifenthrin or talstar. And then the two main systemic materials that people use are merit and safari. There is a lot of work being done in Western North Carolina. Um, there's a group called the Forest Restoration Alliance, uh, threatenforests.com, I want you to be aware of. Um, this is the group that is looking at developing resistance to hemlock woolly adelgia, along with other researchers across uh, the country. And um, so if you find a tree that looks like it's growing good, and it looks like it may have some natural resistance, this is the group that you can notify about that. Then uh, the state of North Carolina also has this um, hemlock restoration initiative, and that's an educational branch uh, to landowners and homeowners on how to control hemlock woolly adelgid, um, providing resources as far as looking at biological control. Also, there's a, a, a great group in Georgia, the SaveGeorgiaHemlocks.org. So I, I put that information down there too, that has good information on control practices. Um, there have been a lot of predators that have been tried. Um, this isn't work that I've, I've done myself, so I only know what others have told me. Um, that beetle that first came in that people were first releasing were the Sasagiskimnus beetle or Sassy beetle, um, and that really didn't seem to pan out as well. Uh, the Laricobius beetles, the Larry beetle, some people call them, seems to work better, um, and uh, they're, they're, they're very difficult to rear. Um, as all of these are. And um, uh, we have some native Laracobius in our, in our forest that feed that uh, on that white pine um, adelgid. Um, the skimness beetle is a, another one that is more of a summer feeding. The Larry, Larry beetle is a winter feeding. Um, so a lot of folks like to see those together. Um, recently, there's been a lot of work done on these silver flies, where the, the larvae of the flies pictured here uh, feeds on the adelgid. There have been releases of all of these throughout Western North Carolina, um, and uh, hopefully that's making a positive impact. Trying to find those trees that are resistant, it's very easy to, um, to root hemlocks, as uh, photographs above uh, indicate. And there is uh, work done on trying to identify trees that appear to be resistant um, and then taking them to a location where they can be challenged with the adelgid to, to see if they really are resistant or not. Uh, here's a, a 
photograph of some hemlocks in uh, Wilkes County. There's been a lot of research done on um, uh, these appear to be resistant or tolerant to the adelgid. Um, and hopefully that work can help restore uh, hemlocks that have been lost in forests um, due to this pest. So again, if you do find a hemlock when you're out hiking or whatever, um, that you feel like could potentially be one of these survivor hemlocks, could have some natural resistance, um, if you go to that uh, Saving Threatened Forests website, they have a partnership with TreeSnap where you can uh, input that information and then they can go back and locate that tree and, um, and it might be the one, it might be the one that has uh, the most natural resistance that helps save this species. There are many trees that look good. And again, these are ones that tend to receive a lot of sunlight. Um, uh, and so that's why this kind of work has to be done uh, to really determine what the cause is, why, why that particular tree is looking good. Chemical control has been uh, sort of the mainstay though for preserving hemlocks. Uh, this photograph is a composite of many different ways of, of putting out these systemic materials. They're all based on um, measuring the diameter of the tree to figure out how much chemical is needed. Uh, spraying the trunk of the tree uh, is usually done with the, um, the safari material and uh, it's actually taken up through the trunk of the tree and translocated up, um, up to the foliage. Uh, a cheaper route uh, is using, and it's typically with merit, uh, doing a, a drench around the roots of the tree, or uh, that little blue hand there that has those white dots in the very center, those are uh, tablets that have the imidacloprid, the uh, merit material in it that um, can be put around the um, root system of the tree. Uh, but for some of these really big trees, that's expecting a lot. So these really big, tall trees, and especially as that tree has less and less foliage um, to take pull that chemical up, they don't tend to work as well. So um, there are guidelines as to how kind of how far gone a tree can be before you would probably want to uh, treat it. But my experience has been if it's a healthy tree and it has any foliage at all, that um, and if it's a tree that's important to you, then um, it, in many cases they do come back uh, given good weather conditions after treatment. Here's a photograph of a hemlock that uh, blew over in the uh, South Mountain State Park um, to show you kind of the root system of the hemlocks. Uh, so the idea is to put the chemical four to six inches into the soil. Um, uh, about a foot and a half from the trunk. The simplest thing to do is just loosen the soil and pour the chemical mixed in a gallon of water and then cover it back up. And um, those are the rates on the Merit and Safari. But the thing you wanna do is keep monitoring that new growth. So here's a, a tree that was successfully treated and you can still see those white balls back on the older foliage. But if you look at the new foliage, there aren't any adelgids. Now here's a case where the, a treatment didn't work. So on the new growth, again, at the base of each of those needles, you'll see a nymph and that indicates that they are moving on to the new growth and are still impacting that tree. But here's some photographs that I took a few years ago at the Crossnore Nursery um, of some uh, trees in 2011 that we treated a, a couple of years and you can see how they, they grew back those three in the middle, and, and here's just a close-up of those trees with their new foliage. What I see is that uh, I have, again, have some hemlocks on my property that uh, I have never treated, and I really don't see a lot of adelgid on them. But again, these are in the sun, um, and I think we, we probably have some native predators that are feeding on them as well. Now, uh, something that I get asked about a lot is the decline in, in white pines. These are white pines that are actually part of a storage facility for Christmas tree growers. And if you drive around on the parkway, you'll see white pines that are starting to die. 
Um, it's not a well understood problem. There are many pests that can be involved. But one of the issues with white pines um, is that they, they don't do well in, when planted in like an old pasture or disturbed site or in, a, in an area like this where there's a, a lot of people driving on the roots. Uh, you know, people are loading Christmas trees back in those and pulling them back out. All of those things can put stress on these trees and cause a problem. So, uh, so again, this is hopefully something that um, we can work more on in the future. Christmas trees have an unusual set of pests. Of course, we have some things like balsam woolly adelgid or phytophthora root rot that can kill the trees. But we also have issues just with cosmetic pests like uh, the twig aphid causing needle curl here that really don't impact the tree, but can affect the quality of the tree. And then um, the problems that we have the most problem with now are regulatory pests. This is a spotted lanternfly in a Fraser fir, which I took a photograph of in Pennsylvania, not in North Carolina. But we're very concerned about this pest um, affecting the Christmas tree industry. Uh, balsam woolly adelgid, again, like hemlock woolly adelgid is an introduced pest. You'll see those white cotton balls on the bark of the tree, not on the, the needles. So they will even be on the buds as pictured here. Uh, they're always associated with true firs, natural stands, or yard trees, as I have photographed here. It causes hard reaction wood so that the tree um, just kind of chokes itself off. And the, the picture of the fellow looking at the chainsaw, he, he was cutting trees, got into some woolly trees, and it, 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 he didn't think his chainsaw was working good. He thought something was wrong with the saw when it was really something was wrong with the tree. Uh, for many years, this was one of our worst pests in uh, Fraser fir. We haven't had as much problems with them so far as, as growers have learned how to um, uh, control them. But then also on our natural stands, these are photographs uh, taken from Mount Mitchell. Most of those photographs were taken by Fred Hain. Uh, you can see the impact of the uh, balsam woolly adelgid as it came into our area. It was first found uh, in the mid to late 50s in Western North Carolina. But uh, there's been a lot of regeneration and it really didn't impact uh, the natural stands as, as it, well, it impacted them, but it, it didn't wipe them out, thank goodness. Um, and so again, work is being done by this Forest Restoration Alliance looking at uh, Fraser Fir, some uh, survivors from the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and, and other places to see if, if there is true resistance to this pest. So these are some of those seedlings being challenged with uh, balsam woolly and adelgid infested bowls um, to see if they are truly are resistant or not. Another pest that we have a lot of in uh, Christmas trees that's been a, a, a bad problem for us is the elongate hemlock scale. This is again an introduced pest. It causes modeling of the foliage on some trees like you see here with the yellow and green blotches. And then the males produce a white fluff that uh, some people have mistaken for hemlock woolly adelgid, but it's not. Um, the, uh, it's a very difficult pest to control. The main hosts are hemlocks, firs, and true firs, and Douglas fir. Um, this uh, map we have about one minute, Jill. Okay, thanks. This uh, shows where uh, elongate hemlock scale is currently found, um, and so uh, uh, it, the males are white, the females are brown. Um, and it can be confused with hemlock woolly adelgid, but it, it's always on the back of the needle and not on the stem. Uh, we've seen limited impact of it in our woods here in North Carolina. Um, here we see a shoot where there's been elongate hemlock scale in past years and it hasn't gotten up on anybody. But it is an issue, particularly in sending to Florida and states that don't have a lot of hemlocks, they don't have the scale but they're concerned about it getting on their conifers down there. Sometimes the weather can be better. Here we have a case where the scale is being affected by a fungal pathogen due to all the wet weather that we've had lately. Anyway, that's a, a quick run through some pests of conifers. Uh, I guess we don't have a lot of time. Here's my contact information, my email, and uh, our website for information about Christmas trees. Kelly, do we have time for those few questions? We do, and it looks like there's two questions in the chat. So the first one is, 
Um, given limited resources, are there certain stand or tree attributes that you would recommend for treatment in a forest setting? Oh, um, and uh, there has been a lot of work looking at lower rates of these chemicals. Um, and so that's one way to make resources last better. Um, I would think those that are in sunnier locations and are growing better would probably better be better resources. Um, I don't do a lot of work in forest type situations, so I don't know, Kelly or anybody else have any other thoughts along those lines? Um, that might be a better question for Brian Heath and Craig Long with the North Carolina Forest Service. They've done a ton of hemlock treatments over the past several years, um, but I do know one of the things that they look for is a somewhat healthy tree, so a tree that they can actually still save. Um, once it's too far gone, you can't bring it back and the tree isn't really going to be transporting those chemicals up into the canopy anyway. Right, yeah. Um, and the second question is, how often should hemlocks be treated with, a, with an imidacloprid ground soak? I have a small grove of about 25 trees that I've treated twice. The last treatment was about 10 years ago and the trees still appear to be doing well. Yeah, and so the, um, uh, that uh, midacloprid product, you know, they say it lasts five to seven years or even longer. And so how readily those trees are going to be reinfested depends on what's around them um, and if there's a delgid close by. But what you always want to keep looking at is the new growth. And so if you start seeing it on the new growth, that's when I would uh, reapply. If you're not seeing it there, you know, even though it's been 10 years, uh, I think you'd be good to go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jill. I don't see any more questions in the Q&A box. Um, our next presentation will start in two minutes. So if you want to take a very short break and then Ryan Blado with the U.S. Forest Service is going to talk to us about forest diseases to be aware of. All right, our next speaker is Ryan Blado with the U.S. Forest Service Forest Health Protection in Region 8, and he is going to talk about some common for forest diseases you may see in trees in Western North Carolina. So Ryan, I will turn it over to you. All right, thanks Kelly. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the invite to talk to you guys today. My name is Ryan Blado I'm with the uh, Forest Health Protection in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I'm going to see if I can get these slides advancing. Um, if you haven't met me yet, here's a picture of me in uh, a world of virtual webinars. Uh, this is what I look like if, uh, if I know you, and I, it looks like I know quite a few of you on today, uh, hello. Uh, if you don't know me, um, I hope someday you find the time to introduce yourself if you're interested in forest pathology. Um, I'm going to talk about a variety of things today. I, uh, I tried to pick the things that I got the most calls about and the most interest about over the last year. Uh, so we're going to cover a wide variety of diseases, foliar, stem and branch diseases, vascular diseases, some root diseases, and we'll, we'll finish up with some wood decay. 
And uh, I also included at the bottom here some pathology references for uh, those of you who want to take a break from some screen time and do some reading instead. Uh, these are some good pathology references. I think most of you are somewhat familiar with the Sinclair and Lyon book, Diseases of Trees and Shrubs, very comprehensive. Um, the Agrios and Mannion books are, I take a little bit more of an academic approach to forest pathology. And if you don't want to spend any money, there is always the Forest Health Handbook, which is available free from the North Carolina Forest Service website, very applied and uh, very useful. So uh, with that, I'll jump into my first poll question. And uh, if Kelly or Bob can launch this. All right. And so I've gotten this call twice in the last month. Uh, I found this strange growth on my tree. Is this tree going to die? Oh, and as I expected, we got a wide variety of results. Most of you say no, which is good. I don't think there's any right or wrong answer on this one, but I'm going to save the answer for the end of the class so that I can keep you all on, on the edge of your seats until noon. So, so hang tight and we'll talk about this one specifically in the minute. Let's start off with some foliar diseases. And the first one, the most common one that I get calls about every spring, every summer is anthracnose. If you're not familiar with anthracnose, it is a disease. It's a foliage of hardwood, a uh, disease of the foliage of many hardwood species. It's caused by many, many different fungal species, uh, dozens perhaps. And each species of anthracnose fungus infects only one or maybe just a couple of individual tree species. So therefore these diseases are usually referred to by the name of the host. For example, we have maple anthracnose, sycamore anthracnose, elm anthracnose, et cetera. Uh, there's lots of different anthracnose diseases, but they all essentially do the same thing. Anthracnose is characterized by blotches or necrotic lesions on the leaf tissue. These spores are flying around every spring and in cool wet weather just after the leaves leaf out in the spring, those spores land on the leaf surface and infect the leaf and start to kill the surrounding soft mesophyll tissue. There's two stages of this disease. There's that initial infection in early spring, uh, that's the sexual phase. And then once those lesions start to form, those individual lesions can produce more spores all the way throughout the summer months, causing more and more infections on the surrounding leaf tissue and on the surrounding leaves. Because you need water on the leaf surface in order for these spores to infect the leaf, those lesions tend to start to form right along the leaf lesion where water collects, the, or right on the leaf vein where the water tends to collect the most. So look for those leaf spots right along the leaf, uh, leaf veins and surrounding out into that softer tissue. By midsummer, the leaves may take on a scorched or curled appearance. Defoliation is sometimes common in some species like ash or maple. Oaks tend to hold on to their leaves in response to anthracnose. But when those leaves do eventually fall off, whether it's from early defoliation or from no normal defoliation in the, in the fall, um, that diseased tissue falls to the ground with those infected leaves and that's where the fungus overwinters. It's on the previous season's dead leaves. And so then that tissue is ready to infect the new leaves in spring during cool wet weather as those leaves start to expand. And Anthracnose is generally a pretty harmless disease. It can really be an eyesore for landscape trees. And in severe years where we have really cool wet springs, it can be a problem in forested situations. And that's why it does seem to attract a lot of attention. Generally, it's not really gonna harm a plant, um, but severe defoliation in consecutive years, year after year, could potentially weaken a tree and lead to uh, further health problems. Like I said, severity is gonna be worst in the years with cool wet springs, especially right as those leaves are leafing out in early spring. And it can even be made worse by hot summers that stress the tree and reduce its defensive capabilities. Some anthracnose fungi can spread down out of the leaf, down the petiole and into the neighboring twig or shoot tissue. 
uh, such as uh, I'm showing here in sycamore and threatenose, where they can cause little cankers that can actually kill back that twig or kill back that shoot. And that is somewhat common in some of our more aggressive anthracnose species. Taken to an extreme, most of you have probably heard of dogwood anthracnose, which is a really devastating disease of our native dogwood species. It's caused by an introduced pathogen, Discula destructiva, and it was introduced in the late 70s and spread throughout this region in the 80s and 90s. Um, most of our dogwoods above 2,000 feet have been killed as a result. Um, again, this pathogen infects the leaf just like all of our other anthracnose diseases, but it, then it can spread down the, down the twig and into the main stem of the tree where it causes a girdling canker. Um, so really, really uh, environmentally dependent. Generally, because of the environmental constraints, it's very uh, rare or not even found in the Piedmont or coastal plain. And uh, so just be aware that in the mountains, uh, you may run across dogwood anthracnose, but this is sort of the exception to the rule for our anthracnose diseases. Now, conifers have an equivalent disease and we call those needle casts. And needle casts are very much like anthracnose diseases in hardwoods. Again, needle casts are diseases of the foliage of pines and other conifers. They're caused by a wide variety of different fungal species. Um, but generally we call them needle casts. Uh, uh, some of them have more specific names depending on what host they infect. Uh, and, and just like anthracnose diseases, infection occurs on the needles during cool, wet weather in early spring, causing these girdling needle lesions that eventually cause the needle to die and possibly fall off early. Again, these are generally minor diseases. They may be exacerbated. We've seen some some pretty big uh, needle cast outbreaks in the last few years, possibly exacerbated by management practices in those stands, but certainly also climate change appears to be playing a role in that. These really are climate dependent diseases. One of the most uh, famous needle cast diseases is brown spot disease. This is mainly a disease of longleaf pine, which isn't gonna be a huge issue in Western North Carolina. But brown spot can infect all of our species of southern yellow pines, and, and that is increasingly being seen as well for some reason. The seedlings that are infected are usually seldom killed, but it does cause a loss of vigor and poor survival and certainly reduce growth, which, which can be a really big issue for, for early plantings. Again, infection occurs during cool, wet weather and early spring. And it has a, a asexual polycyclic phase. So once the plants become infected, they can reinfect themselves and surrounding plants, really building up disease severity throughout the summer. And just like our anthracnose diseases and other needle cast diseases, that pathogen overwinters on those dead needles and is ready to go in early spring the next year to reinfect plants. So now that you are all experts on anthracnose and needle cast diseases, let's do our second polling question. What is the most effective and practical approach to manage foliar diseases such as oak anthracnose or needle cast? And I'll give you a few seconds for your response. Your credits are on the line, so I hope you get the right answer. And survey says, as I expected, uh, you know, there really isn't a wrong answer for this question. It's, it's kind of a trick, and I, I sort of expected there to be a diversity of, of answers here. It, it really does depend on your situation. In landscape plant, plantings, certainly foliar applications of fungicide in early spring can reduce uh, the severity of anthracnose or needle cast diseases. But again, keep in mind, these are polycyclic diseases that can reinfect and reinfect throughout the summer months as long as conditions are there. So you have to keep applying those fungicides during cool, wet weather. There aren't a lot of resistant species or families available, so plant resistance isn't really an effective tool for the management of these. And these spores are airborne. They can travel you know, 
many, many miles across the landscape. Um, so, so planting resistant species or resistant families uh, really hasn't shown to be effective um, because there is such a diversity of these fungal species out, out there in the landscape. Pruning and thinning to improve airflow has certainly been shown to reduce the severity uh, of these foliar diseases and especially in landscape plantings. Anything that can get those leaves or those needles dried out after it rains or after there's morning dew and reducing the amount of time that they can be exposed to the pathogen is helpful. Certainly destroying infective in, in, infected tissues in the fall after these uh, infected tissues uh, fall off in the fall and winter months uh, can be really, really useful in reducing disease severity, whether that's raking up the leaves under your uh, oak or maple in your front yard and, and burning or otherwise disposing of those, or, or uh, you know, for, for something like brown spot uh, of longleaf, um, periodic burns in the off season to destroy those, those infected needles can really go a long way in reducing brown spot. And yeah, most of this is environmentally driven anyway, so crossing your fingers probably is the most effective and practical approach. So uh, with that, we'll, we'll move on to our stem and branch diseases. I picked a uh, pitch canker for this one. A lot of interest around this in the last couple of years. Uh, pitch canker is a native disease caused by a, a fungus called Fusarium stercinatum. It's economically important uh, disease of Southern pines in our region, but especially worldwide. This is one of those that we have sent to other countries and caused it causes a lot of problem around the world. It's most severe, serious on Virginia and slash pines, but all of our Southern yellow pine species are susceptible to this. Loblolly has a lot of problems with pitch canker as well. Uh, the pitch canker fungus infects through injuries, um, whether that's hail or branch breakage during windstorms. Most, most often it's associated with some sort of insect feeding damage. Um, and once the fungus gets in there, it causes a resin soaked canker. The canker is uh, a necrotic or dead area in the tree sapwood and the phloem tissue, the inner bark. So all of those, all of the vascular tissue uh, in a tree is located just underneath the bark and this fungus attacks that vascular tissue and can effectively girdle that stem and really weaken it. Um, eventually, if those, if those stems or branches are girdled, uh, it, can, it can cause deformities or even branch or stem breakage, which is really common. You can, you can see a heavily impacted stand there in the bottom center picture. Um, but really, there is not a whole lot you can do about pitch canker. There are some resistant species and some resistant families available, but reducing injury in your stand and trying to remove infected, infected individuals to reduce the inoculum load in your stand can really go a long way. Um, but, but pitch canker is one of those that you need to be aware of uh, as you're scouting out your, your pine plantations. Uh, moving on to our vascular diseases, uh, bacterial leaf scorch is one that I've increasingly uh, been seeing and also getting a lot of calls about. Uh, we're not really sure why this seems to be in the upswing, so I wanted to make sure that it's something that is on your radar. Uh, this is unusual and that's it's caused by a vascular bacterium, not a fungus, uh, called Xylella fastidiosa. And right now it's unknown whether this is a native or a non-native pathogen. Uh, it's not well studied. Uh, typically in the past it's been a problem on landscape plantings, but it appears to be showing up more and more in forested situations. Usually it's most uh, problematic on open grown oaks, maples, elms, and, and other hardwoods, but the host list for this pathogen is literally in the hundreds of species right now. And it, it can be found in grasses and herbaceous plants and all sorts of tree species. So this is one where there's a lot of ongoing research. And once this bacteria gets into a tree, uh, and it, it's usually transported into trees by some sort of insect feeding, usually some sort of sap sucking uh, insect, plant hoppers, those types of insects that can actually vector this bacteria. Once it gets into the tree, it can spread through the tree's vascular system where bacterial enzymes and toxins begin to degrade the cellular components of the tree's vascular system. And so the water transport is quickly disrupted in those infected branches and then that bacteria starts to spread throughout the tree. Not very quickly. Um, the bacteria appears to be killed every winter, so it, it kind of dies back into the root system and then 
reinvades the upper part of the tree every spring. And in the summer months, that's when you tend to see those symptoms really get bad. And generally, once a tree's infected, it's gonna kill that tree within three to 10 years. And there really are no effective treatments. There are some systemic antimicrobial compounds that people have experimented with, but right now there really is no effective control for bacterial leaf scorch. So what to look for? As I mentioned, the symptoms are most noticeable in the late summer and the early fall. Generally, when a tree becomes first infected, you're just gonna see a few isolated branches or maybe at one section of the crown begin to die back or, or turn brown in the, in the late summer months. Uh, the leaves are generally held on, but sometimes I have seen some defoliation, some trees shedding their leaves in response to this. But if you can look at the leaves, something that's very diagnostic and separates it out from drought or oak wilt or oak decline, is, a, is oftentimes there's a very noticeable, distinct, colorful margin between the brown tissue and the green tissue. And you can see that in a lot of these pictures here, especially yellow in, in, in oak trees, but I've also seen red margins in between the brown and green tissue as well. And so that, that can be very diagnostic, but truly the only way to uh, confirm the presence of bacterial leaf scorch and this particular bacteria is through laboratory testing, which fortunately is quite easily and readily available. And, and I can accept samples for that if you ever suspect that you have bacterial leaf scorch. So my third and final question, have you seen dying oaks in Western North Carolina in the past few years? And if so, what do you think is the most common cause? And again, I'm expecting a pretty wide diversity of answers here, depending on what you've seen and where you might be at in particular in North Carolina. Oh, that is great. I am really surprised uh, by that answer. So most of you have uh, been seeing oak decline uh, and, and rightly so attributing uh, much of the oak mortality that we've seen over the last few years, few years to that. Uh, of course, there is uh, some people who've seen anthracnose and bacterial leaf scorch, which is great. I uh, Hopefully, you will all be cued in a little bit more on that. Uh, for those of you who aren't seeing dying oaks, that's a, a good thing. Uh, hopefully, that trend will continue. And for those of you concerned about oak wilt, we will jump into that right now. So uh, this is the most up-to-date distribution for oak wilt that we have. Uh, oak wilt is you know, a very, very serious disease in the Eastern United States. Current range map has about seven counties in Western North Carolina where oak wilt is historically known to occur. Uh, outside of those counties, it's never been found, but if you suspect that you have it, we would certainly love to know. Um, oak wilt is an incredibly serious disease, and so I don't want to diminish its importance or its role here in North Carolina. However, it doesn't seem to be having as big of an impact in the southeastern U.S. as it does in places like Texas or the upper Midwest, where we have a much more homogeneous oak species distribution. Because we have such a wide variety of oak species and because of our topography, oak wilt doesn't seem to be doing the damage it does in other parts of the country. But when it gets into a tree, it is incredibly lethal. And we do have it here in Western North Carolina. And so I think it's important to touch on it. Um, the reason this pathogen is so le lethal is that it produces these very small spores called microconidia that once they get into the tree's vascular system, they can literally spread throughout the entire tree in a matter of hours. Uh, so it, it can spread very quickly. And once it gets into the tree, the tree reacts by plugging up its vascular system as a defense response, and effectively the tree kills itself. What's interesting is that once the tree dies, this tree can, uh, this fungus can produce a fruiting body that has a very fruity kind of, some people say it smells like bananas or bubble gum, fruiting body that's attracted to insects, and insects will go in and feed on that fruiting body underneath the bark, pick it up, and then they can transport it to fresh wounds on surrounding trees where it can reinfect uh, additional trees. And so as I mentioned, once it gets into the tree, 
The tree's defense response is to plug up its own vascular system, which kills the tree very, very quickly, just in a matter of a few weeks, typically. Um, so a very, very fast tree killer. Mature trees can go down in just a matter of two to three weeks. I've he's seen it even go faster sometimes. Species in the red oak group are very highly susceptible. There's no resistance to this pathogen at all. Some white oak species exhibit low to moderate resistance and might hang on for a few years with more localized crown dieback. But in general, no oak species that we have here in the eastern U.S. is, is free from, from risk of this, of this pathogen. Once it gets into a tree, um, then the pathogen can then spread down into the root system and then start, start spreading from tree to tree through root grafts, causing these expanding, really devastating disease centers. Uh, this is really a problem where you have very homogenous stands of the same oak species. If you have a high diversity, we don't tend to get these expanding uh, oak wilt disease centers like we do in some other parts of the country. Symptoms can mimic drought, uh, you know, the leaf shedding, uh, the, the sort of brown development of the crown, especially in late summer, those sorts of things, very confusing with drought or bacterial leaf scorch. A um, couple of things to look for is that, especially with red oaks, when they become infected with oak wilt, they will start shedding their leaves very rapidly. And you will see leaves all over the ground. And those leaves might be brown or green or anywhere in between. Also, this fungus causes a vascular discoloration in the, in the, in the outer sapwood. So if you peel back the bark, oftentimes you'll see a, a black or purplish discoloration in the sapwood. So, so look for those diagnostic symptoms of oak wilt. And if you suspect that you have it, get in touch with the North Carolina Forest Service or, the, or, or you can get in touch with me as well. And the last one I wanted to talk about today is heterobacidian uh, root disease. This goes by many, many names. Some of you may have heard of anosis root rot or, or a heterobacidian irregulare. Um, I am not a heterobacidian expert, <laughs> Michelle Cram, uh, down in our uh, Athens, Georgia office is, is much more uh, cued into the complexities of this disease than I am. Um, but the, the hosts of this disease include all of our pine species here in the southeastern U.S. and also cedar and even it's been shown to eke out a living on some hardwoods. So um, this, this fungus tends to act differently in different parts of the country. But in general, what they all have in common is that it becomes a huge problem in thin pine stands. And that's because the infection court, where the fungus gets into these stands, is through fresh wounds and fresh cut stumps. Once it gets into there, it spreads into the root system and it, it's a wood decay fungus that causes a resin soaked yellow stringy decay, um, causes those structural roots to, to, to rot away. The tree can't transport water, can't transport its nutrients. And it also becomes structurally compromised. And these trees often be often are subject to wind throw and falling over before they die. Right, uh, you have about one minute. Thanks, Kelly. Almost done. Uh, what to look for with heterobacinian? Uh, this can be a pretty cryptic disease in the Southeast. What I generally recommend if, if you suspect that you have a heterobacinian root disease pocket in your pine plantation or in your pine forest, um, look for these fungal fruiting bodies right about this time of year. Anywhere between December and March is a really great time. These are annual conchs that are, fruit, that are formed right at the base of the tree. And once we get into midsummer, they're gone. They degrade and they're gone. So you can really only look for these fungal fruiting bodies uh, in, in late winter, early spring. They're brown with a cream colored margin. Oftentimes, you'll only find them on trees that are recently died or maybe trees within the last one to two years. And again, it's really critical to identify if you have this, because although it is a slow spreader, just a couple of meters per year and on most sites, uh, once it does get into a stand, it can continue to spread even through dead stumps, um, through root contact or through root grafts. And so it can cause a lot of damage and be very destructive to your stands. All right, and uh, before I take any questions, I thought I would just get to the macro fungi. I don't know what it is, uh, but in the last year, I have gotten more questions about brackets, conch shelves, 
you know, a few spongy things growing on bark than I ever have before. And I think a lot of people are out just wandering the woods alone right now and looking around. Um, all of these, uh, all of these fungi are wood decay fungi. Um, they, they cause different types of wood dec decay. The one I showed at the beginning is the bear's head or the lion's mane fungus. Um, a, a very common one. Uh, it is a choice edible. It's one of my favorite mushrooms to eat, but there's lots of different brackets, conch shelves out there. All of them are decay fungi. Uh, they can be difficult to identify, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some resources here in a sec. Um, but in general, what you can look for, a good rule of thumb, is that if they're widely scattered, strongly attached fruiting bodies, like you see with the Ganoderma here on the left, or the ting tinder fungus, which is really common on birch, or the shaggy polypore, you know, very common on a lot of our hardwood species. If they're very firmly attached, they're generally causing a heartwood rot. That inner core of the tree is rotting out. If they're more scattered, like you see on the right side of that uh, dead hemlock next to the Ganoderma, uh, or like the tur turkey tail fungus uh, on the lower right, um, those are generally going to be sapwood rotters, and they're 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 rotting away that outer shell of sapwood just beneath the bark. So so look for those types of patterns. Uh, a lot of people are interested in mushrooms and identification of these fruiting bodies. There is no good one text for the southeastern U.S. If you really want to have a good comprehensive ability to ID these, you need to get all four of these books. They cover different species. Uh, keep in mind that the names change, uh, the scientific names of these uh, organisms often change a lot, so it's good to, to uh, consult more than one reference. And uh, Kelly reminded me something yesterday, uh, a good thing to keep in mind since we were talking about edibles a little bit. All mushrooms are edible, but some only once in a lifetime. So never eat any mushroom that you're not 100% certain you have identified correctly. Um, so with that, I will take any questions, and I just wanted to put this up here. I know it's a lot of doom and gloom today, but eventually all trees will die. Keep that in context. Don't panic if you see dying trees. Here's my contact information, and I'll take any questions that we have time for. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. I think there's a lot of interest in this topic based Great. on the amount of questions we have. Unfortunately, we only have two minutes, so we may not get to all of the questions, but thank you for putting yeah. your email up there, Ryan. And if anyone has an outstanding question that's not answered, I invite you to email him directly. So the first question we have is, I have seen a lot of dieback and mortality in sycamores in Western North Carolina, mainly along creeks and rivers. What may be causing this? Yeah, I think it's probably a combination of a couple of things. Uh, most often when I see those dying sycamores and, and, and I and my, and my uh, coworkers have noticed them as well, um, it looks to be a combination of anthracnose. Uh, if you're seeing a lot of brown sycamores, especially uh, mid to late summer, that may be something as innocuous as just uh, anthracnose diseases, which can cause some dieback but also sycamores are highly susceptible to bacterial leaf scorch. And so as you're driving down the road in those riparian corridors, if you're seeing dying sycamore, bacterial leaf scorch may be playing a big role in that. Another question, are there other pathogens that might affect dogwood leaves? My dogwood has wilted leaves, but it does not look like anthracnose. Absolutely, um, and that's a really good question. There is a very similar disease called dogwood spot anthracnose which acts very much like the other anthracnose diseases I talked about. It's important to distinguish between the two. Dogwood spot anthracnose is, is pretty harmless, but it can infect your leaves and those flowers in spring and cause leaf lesions and even those leaves to take on a scorched, wilted, black appearance by midsummer. As long as you're not getting dieback or those girdling cankers, most likely you're dealing with dogwood spot anthracnose. Also keep in mind, there's another disease called powdery mildew, which can be bad on dogwoods as well, especially during cool, wet summers, or cool, wet springs followed by hot, dry summers. Thank you so much. It is now 12 o'clock. So there are three questions we didn't get to. Um, if y'all want to send that to Ryan and he can answer y'all directly, that would be wonderful. In the meantime, I put the survey um, for the end of the seminar um, in the uh, chat there. So if you would please complete that, that would be wonderful. Um, we really appreciate all of your feedback so we can know how to provide a much better 
webinar and where to improve moving forward. With that, again, we want to thank you for participating today. Thank you for all of your thoughtful questions and interactions. And we hope y'all stay warm and have a wonderful rest of the day.